Hello friends, today we're going to be studying the topic of finality in Islam. Often referred to as the problem of the seal of the prophets, which is that from an Islamic perspective, the prophet Muhammad is the final messenger of God unto humankind, that no religion or revelation will come after the prophet Muhammad. This is looked at both from the Quran itself, where it says that the Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, meaning he hath sealed this and closed it. Secondly, we have the issue of the Hadith, where it seems very clear from the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad that he is the last prophet. So it's not just the seal, but it's also qualified by statements from the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad that he is the last prophet of God unto humankind. We're going to look at this through a series of videos, so please understand that a true understanding from my perspective of this topic as it relates to the Baha'i Faith will actually necessitate a series of investigations to, if you will, explore this picture more fully from the Quran and from the Baha'i writings. I've seen many different answers to this topic within the Baha'i world. And one of the things I want to state up front so that there is not a misunderstanding between uh, myself and any Muslim viewers, is that the Baha'i writings themselves are very clear that the Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the Prophets. Not only that, that the Prophet Muhammad is himself the last Prophet before the Day of God. If you will, the Yom Adin, the Day of Ingathering, the End Times. I want to begin here with a couple quotes from Baha'u'llah on this issue. In truth I say, on this day the blessed words, but he is the apostle of God and the seal of the prophets, have found their consummation in the verse, the day when mankind shall stand before the Lord of the worlds. Render thou thanksgiving unto God for so great a bounty. In this quote, Baha'u'llah is stating, true or not, that the Prophet Muhammad is the Apostle of God and the seal of the Prophets, and that this issue, this topic, this concept has found its consummation in this day, when mankind shall stand before the Lord of the Worlds. Once again, it's important to understand that from a Baha'i perspective, it is not that the Prophet Muhammad isn't the last Prophet before the Day of God, it's that the Day of God has actually come. Now, next quote. It is evident that every age in which a manifestation of God hath lived is divinely ordained, and may in a sense be characterized as God's appointed day. This day, however, is unique, and is to be distinguished from those that have preceded it. The designation Seal of the Prophets fully revealeth its high station. The prophetic cycle hath verily ended. The eternal truth is now come. He hath lifted up the ensign of power, and is now shedding upon the world the unclouded splendor of his revelation. Thou art he by whose name the hidden secret was divulged, and the well-guarded name was revealed, and the seal of the sealed-up goblet were opened, shedding thereby its fragrance over all creation, whether of the past or of the future. He who was a thirst, O my Lord, hath hastened to attain the living waters of thy grace, and the wretched creature hath yearned to immerse himself beneath the ocean of thy riches. Several themes appear in these second two quotes. One is that the designation, the seal of the prophets, revealeth the high station of this day. It is stated clearly that the prophetic cycle hath verily ended, and the eternal truth is now come. The claim once again is that the Prophet Muhammad was the seal of the prophets, that he was the last prophet of God unto humankind before the great day. The second, it talks of how these sealed up goblets were opened, referencing that revelation was sealed and has now been opened. So we're going to put this aside for a moment because many of these themes actually appear directly from the Quran. 
what I wish to just simply summarize in this point is, the Baha'i writings themselves never claim that the Prophet Muhammad is not the last Prophet, nor is he the seal of the Prophets. Instead, the claim is actually that there was a prophetic cycle that ended with the Prophet Muhammad prior to the coming of the Great Day of God. And it's important to understand that this, when you look at the Quran and the Hadith themselves, that actually in the Day of God, there are Prophets. <laughs> Jesus himself comes. And you actually have these prophetic figures appearing before the Lord of the Worlds, on the Day of Resurrection. So it's not that no Prophets can, can or will come after the Prophet Muhammad, Rather, the issue is whether or not that event of the Great Day of God is itself self-evident and obvious, or does it actually have to be investigated? This is a theme we're going to return to several times. For now, I want to state that we're going to turn particularly to the Quran itself. The Quran, no matter what the Hadith say, must be in the end the ultimate authority on what God wished to communicate to humankind. This should seem obvious <laughs> because the Hadith themselves were collected by individuals. In these cases, century to centuries after, where actually the statements of the Prophet Muhammad, regardless of Hadith sciences, and the attempts to verify and back them up by chains of narrators, what God revealed unto humankind was the Quran, as that wholly authentic, wholly authoritative, definitive statement on what Islam has to say. The same goes for Islamic tradition of understanding regarding doctrine and concepts within the Quran, or sorry, within Islam. I cannot go by Islamic tradition and Islamic understandings and Islamic interpretation any more than a Muslim would themselves find, feel themselves beholden to follow Christian traditional interpretation. They should, if you will look at the, the one video we have on the authenticity of the Bible in the Quran, they should actually hold themselves beholden to the New Testament or to the Old Testament, but to actually have a Muslim agree that they should be bound, for example, by the Council of Nicaea, which happened in the 4th century, no Muslim would ever actually accept this. The same as well goes for any Christian. They will hold themselves beholden unto the Torah, unto the prophets of the Old Testament, but do not believe that they have to be bound by the interpretations of the Jewish community. So we take the Quran itself as obviously above the Hadith, and the Quran obviously above the historical understandings and interpretations of the Islamic community. This doesn't mean we don't have to consider them, yet they cannot bind us that, well, this is how Islam has been seen for this long. Because of course, a Christian would say to a Muslim, Okay, well, obviously you're wrong on this point because this is actually how Christianity has seen itself for this period of time. And then the Christian would have to turn to the Jewish individual and hear the same thing. Well, you can't be correct because this is actually how rabbinical or pharisaical Judaism has seen things for this long. I want to do as best as I can to really, really, truly look at the Quran and what it says primarily. And of course, given this is a Baha'i Deepening, we're going to look at a series of Baha'i quotes, but try to show how these are really echoing themes that appear within the Quran itself. Some of these sections um, are going to look at the Arabic itself, which I can read. Yet at the same time, I'm not assuming everyone can read Arabic in order to go through this. I want to begin, before we jump into the Quran itself, with one quote from Baha'u'llah, from the Seven Valleys, and this is from the Valley of Search. The true seeker hunteth not but the object of his quest, and the lover hath no desire save union with his beloved. 
nor shall the seeker reach his goal unless he sacrifice all things. That is, whatever he has seen and heard and understood, all must he set at naught, that he may enter the realm of the Spirit, which is the city of God. Labor is needed if we are to seek him. Ardor is needed if we are to drink of the honey of reunion with him. And if we taste of this cup, we shall cast away the world. On this journey the traveler abideth in every land and dwelleth in every region. In every face he seeketh the beauty of the friend. In every country he looketh for the beloved. He joineth every company and seeketh fellowship with every soul, that haply in some mind he may uncover the secret of the friend, or in some face he may behold the beauty of the loved one. I bring up this quote because Baha'u'llah speaks of a seeker, one who is hunting his beloved, and gives this concept of labor, of ardor, of search, of traveling in every land to find the beauty of the beloved. What often happens when I read these quotes is I think back to those first souls in the early history of any revelation, who in order to find their beloved, had to break with tradition, had to seek and think anew concerning the possibility of God's revelation unto humankind. How a Muslim, sorry, how an Arabian man or woman in Saudi Arabia in the seventh century would have to turn from their own heritage, whether the Baha'i faith is true or not, this is what happened. They would have to turn from their own heritage, their own background, and put the object of their quest, their beloved, above the traditions and historical interpretations and understandings of their community. Any Christian from a Muslim perspective would have had to have done this. And likewise, any Roman centurion any Pharisee, any Sadducee, any Jewish individual would have had to have put aside their own historical interpretations and understandings and seek anew and put the object of their quest, the union with their beloved, above their own community's understandings. Even if we were to go back further and further and we were to look at some individual who, for example, had listened to the teachings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or of Joseph within the Old Testament, who suddenly met with the revelation and teachings of Moses, surely would have seen them as different from what they had known. Yet they themselves, just like the Jew to the Christian, to the Christian to the Muslim, and potentially the Muslim to the Baha'i, would have to set aside the historical understandings and make truly the beauty of the friend what they're seeking. Before we enter, as I said, there's going to be aspects of Arabic within this study. In this case, it's important to understand how Arabic is formed. So for example, in English, we have the words to collect or collection or collector or collectible. There is a common root in each of them, just like in to decide, to be decisive, decision or indecision. There's a, there's a core root to that, those words from which all the other ones are derived. Arabic itself is a triliteral root language, which means you'll have, in the vast, vast, vast majority of cases, you'll actually have three letters that from these three letters, there are different forms that, from which you get new words. Um, the example I wanted to use is actually the letters in English, obviously, K, K, T, T, and B. But, so from these three letters, we get Kataba, which is to write. We also get Kitab, which is a book or a thing that's been written. We have Katib, once again, k, t, and b, katib, and we get, for example, a writer or a scribe, or we have maktaba, you have a 
M at the beginning of that word, but the maktaba, uh, this would be, for example, a library or a place where books are found. So it's important to understand this because when we're looking at the Quran, um, there really is a challenge because if you begin looking in the Quran from the English translations, well, a translator can actually take, uh, for example, a word like, I don't know, kitab, and he might say, translate this as a book in one case and scroll as another. But in the Arabic itself, the word is, a, is, is identical. The same thing happens, for example, in translations of the Old Testament from Hebrew to English or from Greek. Uh, into English for the New Testament, you'll have actually the same word who, uh, and not for any nefarious reasons, uh, translators have actually taken and, and they've given different translations of it in English, although if a you know, individual who was reading Greek was reading them, they would see this as the same word. So what are we doing? We're taking a study of the Quran, in this case, from the root letters themselves and trying to understand all different sorry, understand, to collect all different forms of that work or word um, based upon the Arabic root. So if we want to understand what collecting is, we want to look at how that word collector, collect, collection, collectible, or to collect are used within this, 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 this work, the Quran, based from the Arabic. And this is important because very often Understandably, we can actually take our our sort of cultural background understanding to a text because we see a word that we ourselves are familiar with. The example I, I often use, which is sort of ridiculous, is that some individual who's reading, for example, Karl Marx, and they hear Karl Marx writing about false consciousness. And when they culturally think of false consciousness, in, in our day, they actually think of a zombie. So they think that Karl Marx is actually talking about a zombie apocalypse, when he's really actually talking about false consciousness that has been bred into the community, and actually he has a state of being of, if you will, the proletariat. Um, it's really important because, as we're going to see through this study of uh, the seal, as well as others that come, it's very, very common for people to bring their cultural background to the understanding of that text. What we have to do is actually treat Karl Marx in his use of false consciousness, his writings actually as the dictionary itself to understand, well, what did he really mean? What did he mean by that term? Likewise with the Quran, we want to take the Quran itself first and foremost as the ultimate authority on the words that it uses. So how can one do this? Um, just so you know, I'm actually using a concordance of the Quran by uh, Hannah Cassis, and this work can be found online, and you can find uh, root search engines online where you can go into the Quran and try and say, well, what is this word? mean? What is, this, what is the Quran trying to convey in this case? You can look at its triliteral root, you can then take a collection of all the times it's used and try and do your best to understand it. Um, so this here is a study of the, the Arabic root, khatama, uh, kha, ta, and ma, in the sounds of to seal. So what will we be looking at? We'll be looking at khatama, which is to seal something or to set a seal. Uh, we can look at khatim, which is a seal, a noun. Um, you can have different things that something is being sealed, is sealing. We're generally <laughs> really taking the collection of this word, this root, from the Quran and trying to make it the, the core of our study. So when the Quran states that Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, what does this mean? Okay, so what is the text itself? We're going to look, for example, first at the quote in question. And this is from the Quran in Surah or chapter 33. And we're looking at verses 38 to 40. No blame shall be attached to the prophet for doing what is sanctioned for him by God. Such was the way of God with those who went before him who fulfilled the mission with which God had charged them, 
fearing God and fearing none besides him. Sufficient is God's reckoning. Muhammad is the father of no man among you. He is the apostle of God and the seal of the prophets. Surely God has knowledge of all things. So it is here in verse 40 of this chapter or surah that we have this statement. He is the apostle of God and the seal of the prophets. Khatam and Nabi'in. So that Khatam is the seal. Khatama Khatam. At this point, it's simply saying he is the apostle of God and the seal of the prophets. Our goal in this section of this study is to try to understand what that word actually means, independent of historical interpretations, and for the time, independent of any other Islamic traditions or Islamic texts. So we're going to move first here to the Quran. I'm going to say chapter and verse instead of surah and ayat. Um, chapter 2, verses 6 to 7. As for the unbelievers, alike it is to them, whether thou hast warned them or hast not warned them, they do not believe. God has set a seal on their hearts and on their hearing, and on their eyes is a covering, and there awaits them a mighty chastisement. It seems very clear that seal means something that has been closed, something that has been shut up. Um, why God does this? This is a separate theme in the Quran, we'll have to study it a different time. And what this means of God doing this. Yet regardless, no matter what we do, the, the eyes are sealed, the ears are sealed. They are closed up and shut. And God has done this. We're going to jump quickly to Quran, chapter 6, verses 42 to 47. Indeed, we sent to nations before thee, and we seized them with misery and hardship, that haply they might be humble. If only when our might came upon them, they had been humble. But their hearts were hard, and Satan decked out fair to them what they were doing. So when they forgot what they were reminded of, we opened unto them the gates of everything, until when they rejoiced in what they were given, we seized them suddenly, and behold, they were sore confounded. So the last remnant of the people who did evil was cut off. Praise belongs to God, the Lord of all being. Say, What think you? If God seizes your hearing and sight, and sets a seal upon your hearts, who is a God other than God to give it back to you? Behold how we turn about the signs, yet thereafter they are running away. Say what think you, if God's chastisement comes upon you, suddenly or openly, shall any be destroyed except the people of the evildoers. And it states, what think you if God seizes your hearing your sight, takes away your hearing your sight, and sets a seal upon your heart, who is a God other than God that can give it back to you? So, this sounds very much like the passage before. It, it is a sealing of the heart. And given the context, it sounds very clearly that it is actually a closing off of the heart, a shutting of the heart. Yet at the same time, there's a different facet of this quote. It says, And sets a seal upon your hearts, who is a God other than God to give it back to you? So it can be opened. God can seal something, and it can be fully sealed, the heart in this case, and maybe the eyes and the ears, yet those seals can be opened, or if you will, taken off. Um, and this is important because it seems like, as I said at the beginning, that there is a seal of the prophets, where um, God has sealed prophethood, but there seems to be individuals that come after that event in the day of God. However, we're going to put that aside again for now. Quran, chapter 36, verses 60 to 65. Sons of Adam, did I not charge you never to worship Satan, your acknowledged foe, but to worship me? Surely that is a straight path. Yet he has led a multitude of you astray. Had you no sense? 
This is the hell you have been promised. Burn in it this day on account of your unbelief. On that day we shall seal their mouths, their hands will speak to us, and their very feet will testify to their misdeeds. So it's here in actually verse 65 that we have this concept of a seal on their mouths. And again, remember that we have this concept of closing. He shall seal their mouth so their hands will speak to us and their feet will testify to their misdeeds, which means they cannot testify through their mouths. Once again, very clear that it's closing. It doesn't have this notion that that actually can be taken off in this theme. Yet it does have this idea where one thing is sealed, which is the mouth, yet the testimony or the speaking comes a different way. Okay, so we have it, a seal means to be closed, yet God can remove such seals. And even when one thing is sealed, another means of communication can happen. This hand speaking to us and their te feet testifying to their deeds. That is the bounty whereof God gives glad tidings to his servants who believe and do righteous deeds. Say, No reward do I ask of you for this except the love of those near of kin. And if anyone earns any good, we shall give him an increase of good in respect thereof. For God is oft forgiving, most ready to appreciate the service. What do they say? He has forged a falsehood against God? But if God willed, he could seal up thy heart. And God blots out vanity and proves the truth by his words. For he knows well the secrets of all hearts. He is the one that accepts repentance from his servants and forgives sins, and he knows all that ye do. And he listens to those who believe and do deeds of righteousness and gives them increase of his bounty. But for the unbelievers, theirs is a terrible penalty. It seems very clear that this is the same theme, that it is actually being closed or covered so it cannot properly work anymore. We're going to jump ahead. What do those who seek after evil ways think that we shall hold them equal with those who believe and do righteous deeds, that equal will be their life and their death? Ill is the judgment that they make. God created the heavens and the earth for just ends, and in order that each soul may find the recompense of what it has earned, and none of them be wronged. Then seest thou such a one as takes as his God his own vain desire? God has, knowing him as such, left him astray, and sealed his hearing and his heart and understanding, and put a cover on his sight. Who then will guide him after God has withdrawn guidance? Will ye not then receive admonition? So God has left him astray, sealed his hearing and his heart and put a cover on his sight. So an individual who actually chooses their vain desires as their God instead of God, God will seal their heart and seal their hearing. Okay? And then it says, who then will guide him after God? We ought not to then receive admonition. This is the theme we saw in the second quote, which is God places a seal upon the heart and upon the hearing of someone so that it is closed. Undeniably, meaning it is shut, it is closed, it is ended. Yet it states, who then will guide him after God? Meaning God can pull that seal off. He can take the seal off the hearing, he can take the seal off the heart. This is the same definition of sealing that we had in the second case, in the second quote that we looked at. And it seems obvious to me that in each of the cases, the seals that God places on, he can actually take off. That it is shut up for a time based on a certain condition. We're now going to look at the sixth and seventh instance of this Arabic root from Khatama, 
to seal or to be sealed. Truly the righteous will be in bliss. On thrones of dignity will they command a sight of all things. Thou wilt recognize in their faces the beaming brightness of bliss. Their thirst will be slaked with pure wine sealed. The seal thereof will be musk. And for this let those who aspire, who have aspirations. With it will be given a mixture of tasneem, a spring from the waters whereof drink those nearest to God. Those in sin used to laugh at those who believed, and whenever they passed by them, used to wink at each other in mockery. And when they returned to their own people, they would return jesting. And whenever they saw them, they would say, Behold, these are the people truly astray. But they had not been sent as keepers over them. But on this day, the believers will laugh at the unbelievers. On thrones of dignity, they will command a sight of all things. Will not the unbelievers have been paid back for what they did? I suggest individuals actually read this uh, passage several times and look at the context um, of, uh, sorry, chapter 83. This is talking about in this day, the righteous will be in bliss. They're sitting on thrones of dignity. You can recognize their faces, this beaming brightness. And this is the day of God. This, this is the end times. This is actually the day that the Prophet Muhammad is speaking of. And that all the prophets prior to Prophet Muhammad have been speaking of. The day of God, the day of judgment, that time when humanity will be brought together under the justice and light of the divine world. It states that you'll see these, uh, the righteous ones in bliss, on thrones of dignity, commanding a sight. Their faces are beaming. And then what does it say? Their thirst will be slaked with pure wine sealed. Maktum. That's at Khatama. So it is, they have been sealed. And the Khitam, the, the actual seal itself is musk. And for this, let those aspire who have aspirations. So imagine this picture. You actually have the righteous in bliss. And for sure, your thirst is slaked with pure wine that's been sealed. Yet in this case, if they're drinking it, the, the seal has been removed. So in the day of God, the seal has been removed and they're actually drinking this pure wine. Interestingly, wine, which is forbidden within Islam. But this is the wine of reunion with God, a subject treated in much Islamic poetic literature and within the Baha'i writings as well. The important issue here is you actually have a seal that has been removed in order. The seal itself is musk, and for this let those aspire who have aspirations. So there's a pure wine that we should be aspiring to, something that we should be longing for and trying to get. Obviously in this context, because these are the righteous who are sitting on thrones of dignity, their faces beaming with brightness, the brightness of bliss, that we wish to be on those thrones as a, as, as, a, as a lover of the Quran and as a lover of God and the Prophet Muhammad. We want to be on those thrones. We want to be with our faces being with brightness and we want to be drinking this wine. We want to be able to unseal the wine and taste of its draft. What do we find about the meaning of seal within this context itself? Uh, it's very, very similar in that the seal is something that closes up. It is something that has been shut and closed. In this case, the seal can be removed by the righteous ones in the day of God. So barring any other interpretations of how this might relate, what does the term seal mean? Because we have actually now come to the end of all instances in the Quran of this Arabic root. We've looked at to seal, a seal that is put on, something being sealed, the verb to seal. We've actually exhausted the instances in the Quran of this term. What does it mean? 
It means something that for sure closes. It completely shuts. Like the ears of the wicked, the eyes of the wicked, the hearts of the wicked, the wine. It's actually something that has shut and closed it off. So there's no doubt that this is actually the meaning of seal. And we're trying to, as best we can, take the Quran itself as the authority in understanding what this means. It doesn't mean we can't actually look at other interpretations and other understandings from the Islamic community, but what does it mean if we're using the Quran as its own dictionary to unravel its meaning? We find that seal, based on the Arabic root, from the Quran does mean being sealed, but a seal that can be taken off. A seal that can be removed. And in two instances, the seal that is set upon the ears and the hearts and the eyes can be removed from God. It's something that is put onable <laughs> and removable. And at the same time, it is something in the other case that the sealed wine can be removed by the righteous ones. So for now, barring any hadith uh, interpretations or understandings, any traditions from the Islamic community. When we hear that Muhammad is the Apostle of God and the seal of the Prophets, can we, from the Quran itself, take this to mean that a seal has been placed, that seal is the Prophet Muhammad, and it can never be removed? I would say no. In the case of the Quran, using it in its own dictionary, using it as the highest authority on what it's attempting to say. A seal is something that God can place on and take off. A seal is something that can be placed on by God, and interestingly, on the pure wine that will slake the thirst of the righteous, it can be removed by the righteous. This sealing does not mean something that is irremovable, and undeniably permanent. So when someone says, well, he is the seal of the prophets, the Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. I'm not saying this is the answer, but one could say, yes, and that seal has now been removed. What do you mean you can't remove a seal? Well, according to the Quran, you actually can. And God especially can do so. His hands are not chained up so that he cannot remove this seal. And in some instances, even seals that ostensibly have actually been placed by God can be removed by the righteous at least according to the Qur'an itself, independent currently of any other hadiths or traditions. This is something that we really have to consider. So, at this moment, I think it's important to understand that very often what's occurring is, and it's understandable, that when someone's saying, well, the Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the Prophets, what has happened is, is a great deal of theory and understanding has been erected around the Quranic verse itself and then delivered as if it is the Quranic verse. Whereas actually if we first, as a first step, peel all that back and say, okay, well, let's put this aside for a second and let's seek our beloved textually in this case, which is the, the meaning and intent of the Quran, independent of any other voices for a moment. Seals, put on, taken off, by God, and it seems, by the righteous themselves, it can be unsealed. So we're going to put this aside. There's going to be further investigation of it and further additions to this concept. I just want to make it understood that this part of how the Seal of the Prophets is usually communicated isn't what the Quran says. It isn't what the Qur'an means, and to make this very, <laughs> uh, um, very direct, it is important that we don't take our interpretations and our understandings over to the Qur'an, at least at an initial stage. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to move on, uh, if you will, to what I would call the great drumbeat of the Qur'an. These are general reasons why, at least for myself, a study of Islam and its concept of utter finality, uh, in the case of the Prophet Muhammad, the traditional interpretation of this 
appeared peculiar. I began studying Islam before I, uh, I studied the Baha'i faith. And I wanted to say something um, and beg the patience of the friends out there that if it had seemed that there was any religion that would not have made, if you will, this, this an issue, that, that no, no messenger could come after, in, in my mind, it just shouldn't have been Islam. Why is this? It's because of what I call the, the great drumbeat of the Quran. We're going to look at passages that will actually attempt to bolster this and make it make more sense. It's that if there really is a, like, a, like a thumping, uh, like a rhythm that actually consistently occurs within the Quran, it's this. God sends his messengers unto a community. He communicates his revelation unto that community. And that community then turns towards them, those messengers, or that messenger, and treats him very, very, very poorly. At times, persecuting, insulting, and even killing that messenger. After which a judgment actually occurs, and there is a punishment from God under that community. Really, the Quran, which I've read many times, um, has this sort of, if you will, like I said, drumbeat in the background of this text, which is God consistently, constantly attempts to reach out to humankind, and every people is sent to Warner, and every nation is sent to Warner in their own language. It's a very beautiful picture, and one I wish I'd learned of earlier in, in my life. Uh, this, this sort of drumbeat of this constant attempt of the divine to reach out to humankind, to actually send guidance, to send the light of um, his love and understanding unto humankind is just over and over and over. It was actually quite foreign to me because I had come from, if you will, a certain perspective of Christianity. And I found this actually quite breathtaking when I first began studying Islam, is that there's this constant, if you will, patient attempt of, of God to reach out to humankind, to send his messengers, and that those individuals consistently end up actually being persecuted, rejected, mocked over and over and over, and yet still they bring the message, still they warn the humanity. So it, it seems strange to me that actually Islam suddenly had this feature, which I found quite peculiar, because I was reading the Quran, uh, not actually the Hadith at the beginning, I was just purely actually studying the Quran itself and read it multiple, multiple times and still do. So this is what I'm going to suggest is this is why I found it actually peculiar because I saw this constant rhythm, this constant drum beat being played by the Quran. And as we shall see, the Quran also consistently stating that there'll be no change in how God relates to his, his people. We're now going to read a series of quotes that are in the sequence, actually, from the Book of Certitude. And this is Baha'u'llah speaking on what I would call this great drumbeat of the Qur'an. It also brings up another concept, which is about how we investigate. So we're going to begin, and we're going to say, treat a small section of it, and then we'll stop for a second, and then we'll read another section, and read another section. I believe it's vitally important that Baha'u'llah, of course, gets to speak in this case, and that we tr do our best at least to understand certain gems that are, if you will, laying within what he has said. So here we begin. Consider the past, how many, both high and low, have at all times yearningly awaited the advent of the manifestations of God in the sanctified persons of his chosen ones. How often have they expected his coming? How frequently have they prayed that the breeze of divine mercy might blow, and the promised beauty step forth from behind the veil of concealment, and be made manifest to all the world? And whensoever the portals of grace did open, and the clouds of divine bounty did rain upon mankind, and the light of the unseen did shine above the horizon of celestial might, they all denied him and turned away from his face, the face of God himself. 
Here Baha'u'llah is like the Qur'an does itself, asking humanity to reflect upon the past, on how in the past so many individuals were waiting the advent of the Promised One of their faith. Yet, though they had sat in prayer, begging for redemption to come, when that figure did shine above the horizon of celestial might, they all denied him and turned away from his face. Imagine, for example, the Jews, from an Islamic perspective, how the Jews and the Christians and the polytheists, the pagans in that day, longed for a relationship and communication from the divine. How from an Islamic perspective, they were hoping to find that promised one, and yet when he actually appeared, how was he treated by the individuals on the Arabian Peninsula? How was his message also therefore treated by individuals outside the Arabian Peninsula subsequently? Reflect. What could have been the motive for such deeds? What could have prompted such behavior towards the revealers of the beauty of the all-glorious? Whatever in days gone by hath been the cause of the denial and opposition of those people, hath now led to the perversity of the people of this age. To maintain that the testimony of providence was incomplete, that it hath therefore been the cause of the denial of the people, is but open blasphemy. How far from the grace of the All-Bountiful and from His loving providence and tender mercies. It is to single out a soul from amongst all men for the guidance of His creatures, and on one hand, to withhold from Him the full measure of His divine testimony, and on the other, inflict severe retribution on His people for having turned away from His Chosen One. And to every discerning observer, it is evident and manifest that had these people in the days of each of the manifestations of the Son of Truth sanctified their eyes, their ears, and their hearts from whatever they had seen, heard, and felt, they surely would not have been deprived of beholding the beauty of God, nor strayed far from the habitations of glory. But having weighed the testimony of God by the standard of their own knowledge, gleaned from the teachings of the leaders of their faith, and found it at variance with their limited understanding, they arose to perpetrate such unseemly acts. That, and that the proofs and evidences for the message of, say, the Prophet Muhammad, was not incomplete because then how could you judge an individual for having rejected it? And this is really important because I think we have to look at this and it's something I often speak on when I have the opportunity to sit with friends of say a Christian or Muslim background in particular. Try to place ourselves in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, in the time of Jesus Christ, or in the Jews case, in the time of Moses, or for that matter, in the time of Isaiah, or some of the lesser prophets in Israel, and try to understand well, that first, many of them were treated horribly, that many of these individuals were persecuted, and some of them killed. And why is it that that was happening? Why is it, if you're a Christian, do you think that when the light of the Word of God manifested within the person of Jesus Christ under the people of Israel, why is it that they were willing to persecute and turn aside from him and then kill him when all of their religious perspective and the fervor, even in the hum of that time, was about the coming of the Messiah? Why is it that the individuals within 7th century Arabia and beyond despite, from an Islamic perspective, longing for the coming of a Redeemer, when he came, turned aside. 
It cannot be that God was unjust, is one of the points of Baha'u'llah, I believe, in here. It cannot be that God withheld the evidence and the divine testimony, because then how could he actually judge them for having rejected it? And then it says this, Had these people sanctified their eyes, their ears, and their hearts, whatever they had seen, heard, and felt, they would not have been deprived of beholding the beauty of God. But, having weighed the testimony of God by the standard of their own knowledge, gleaned from the leaders of their faith, and found it at variance with their limited understanding, they perpetrated such unseemly acts. But this is what we're asking, whether right or wrong, whether true or false, this is what Baha'u'llah is asking the people of Islam and Christianity and Judaism and Buddhism and Hinduism to do in their assessment of his claim. It's why often I'll say, and said at the beginning of this video, I cannot be asked to abide by the historical, say, interpretations of the Catholic or Orthodox Church, or the Pentecostal Church for that matter, or the Alliance United Church, etc., etc. Why? Because in the days of Jesus Christ, when he came, the what people thought, the limited understanding of the people at that time, made them turn away from Jesus Christ. They had a very specific and precise, under, precise understanding of how Jesus was to, or the Messiah was to return, how he was going to treat the law of Moses, what he was going to do, and the ways that he would interact with humankind. Yet from a Christian perspective, they were wrong. From a Muslim perspective, there was a very, very particular things that, sorry, from a Christian perspective, thinking as a Muslim, there were very, very particular things that a messenger of God should have done, must have done, and could not do. Yet from their perspective, the Prophet Muhammad did and said those things. So they turned away. And what is it that Baha'u'llah is saying is, is that if you're a Muslim, how did that happen? Did these individuals weigh the testimony of God by their own standard? And did they also glean from the teachings of the leaders of their faith a series or sets of understandings and then turn with that limit understanding towards the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad, not only reject it, but perpetrate such unseemly acts? Invariably, that's what you must believe as a Muslim. But that's also what you must believe as a Christian looking at Judaism. Consider Moses. He summoned all the peoples and kindreds of the earth to the kingdom of eternity and invited them to partake of the fruit of the tree of faithfulness. Surely you are aware of the fierce opposition of Pharaoh and its people and of the stones of idle fancy which the hands of infidels cast upon that blessed tree. So much so that Pharaoh and his people finally arose and exerted their utmost endeavor to extinguish with the waters of falsehood and denial the fire of that sacred tree. Good tree. Mahala then asks us to look at Moses and how he was summoning the people of the earth and he was turned against by the Egyptians and the people of Pharaoh. Likewise, we have to look at actually how Moses himself was treated in the Tanakh, when we end up looking at the book of Exodus and we look at the subsequent stories within the Torah itself, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, we find that Moses was treated very badly, repeatedly and repeatedly by his own people. And when the days of Moses were ended and the light of Jesus shining forth from the day spring of the spirit encompassed the world, all the people of Israel arose in protest against him. They clamored that he whose advent the Bible had foretold must needs promulgate and fulfill the laws of Moses. Whereas this youthful Nazarene, who laid claim to the station of the divine Messiah, had annulled the laws of divorce and of the Sabbath day, the most weighty of all the laws of Moses. Moreover, what of the signs of the manifestations yet to come? 
These people of Israel are even unto the present day still expecting that manifestation which the Bible hath foretold. How many manifestations of holiness, how many revealers of the light everlasting have appeared since the time of Moses? No other reason except that Israel refused to apprehend the meaning of such words as have been revealed in the Bible concerning the signs of the coming revelation. As she never grasped their true significance, and to outward seeming, such events never came to pass, she therefore remained deprived of recognizing the beauty of Jesus and of beholding the face of God and they still await his coming. Mahala then turns to the cause of Jesus Christ, that the people rose against him. And what did they say? They said that, well, the Messiah, the one that uh, the Bible hath foretold that would come, must fulfill the law of Moses. He must promulgate it, whereas Jesus Christ, as was shown in the New Testament, and in the Acts of the Apostles, etc., seem to have removed the law of Moses. Then he points to this other facet, that what are the signs of the manifestation yet to come? So the people of Israel are still waiting for the Messiah. And it's something that often isn't really contemplated and then attempted to empathize with from either the Christian or the Muslim communities or the Baha'i communities for that matter. They're still waiting for the Messiah. Yet he says, how many manifestations of holiness have come? And why did this happen? They refused to apprehend the meaning of such words concerning the signs of the coming revelation. And to outward seeming such events never came to pass. That's what deprived them. So. What is Baha'u'llah saying? He's saying, please look back at how this has happened from the passage from the pre-Moses time to the time of Moses and how he was rejected and the reasons why they turned aside from him. Then take what you learned there and now move to Jesus Christ. If you were a disciple of Moses and you met the cause of Christianity and we look at the history, what are the reasons why they were actually rejecting Jesus Christ? And then what does Baha'u'llah do? Expectedly, he turns to the Prophet Muhammad. When the unseen, the eternal, the divine essence caused the day star of Muhammad to rise above the horizon of knowledge among the cavils which the Jewish divines raised against the, him, was that after Moses, no prophet should be sent of God. Yeah, Mention hath been made in the scriptures of a soul who must needs be made manifest and who will advance the faith and promote the interests of the people of Moses so that the law of the Mosaic dispensation may encompass the whole earth. Thus hath the king of eternal glory referred in his book to the words uttered by those wanderers in the veil of remoteness and error. The hand of God say the Jews, is chained up. Chained up be their own hands. And for that which they have said, they were accursed. Nay, outstretched are both his hands. The hand of God is above their hands. Although the commentators of the Quran have related in diverse manners the circumstances attending the revelation of this verse, yet thou shouldst endeavor to apprehend the purpose thereof. He saith. So the Prophet Muhammad actually comes. And what was the rejection of the Jewish divines? One, no prophet should be sent after Moses. Two, yes, a soul is actually mentioned and communicated that it must come after, but that individual must promote the interest of the people of Moses and take the law of the Mosaic dispensation and spread it across the planet. And in fact, these are the same objections that are actually made from the Jewish divines to Christianity. A response to which we'll have to examine in a different <laughs> video. 
The issue here is, is that, is, was there reason within their scriptures on the surface that they should believe this? And I have to say, yes, there actually was. You shall not add nor take away from the law of Moses, as it actually is said in Deuteronomy. As well, it surely sounds on the surface that when you look at actually passages concerning the Messiah, that he is actually going to spread the law of Moses and he is actually going to promote the interests of the Jewish people. This is what they, if you will, cried foul at with Jesus Christ. And then he t the Baha'u'llah continues. How false is that which the Jews have imagined? How can the hand of him who is the king in truth, who caused the countenance of Moses to be made manifest, and conferred upon him the robe of prophethood. How can the hand of such a one be chained and fettered? How can he be convinced as powerless to raise up yet another messenger after Moses? Behold the absurdity of their saying, how far it has strayed from the path of knowledge and understanding. Observe how in this day also, all these people have occupied themselves with such foolish absurdities. For over a thousand years, they have been reciting this verse and unwittingly pronouncing their censure against the Jews, utterly unaware that they themselves, openly and privily, are voicing the sentiments and belief of the Jewish people. Thou art surely aware of their idle contention, that all revelation is ended, that the portals of divine mercy are closed, that from the day springs of eternal holiness no sun shall rise again, that the ocean of everlasting bounty is forever stilled, and that out of the tabernacle of ancient glory the messengers of God have ceased to be made manifest. This here brings this whole issue really to a head at this point in a very, very intense way. Baha'u'llah is stating that in the Quran we find this passage where it's accusing the Jews, uh, the Jewish divines of that time, of saying that the hands of God are chained. And how horrendous this is. And then it says, endeavor to apprehend the purpose thereof. How can, you, how can God be conceived as being powerless to raise up another messenger after Moses? And then it says, for over a thousand years, they, the Muslim community, Islamic community, have been reciting this verse in response to the Jewish community. And what? Utterly unaware that they themselves are voicing the exact same sentiments. Thou art surely aware of their idle contention that all revelation is ended. The portals of divine mercy are closed and no sun shall rise again. And this is something that we're going to have to look at increasingly as we move on. Which is, this is what I meant by this issue of the, the, the great drumbeat of the Quran, is that we're told that no change shall happen. We shall see no change in the ways of God. And what does he do? He actually sends messengers. What happens when those messengers are sent is that based on historical interpretations of the community and understandings of the people of the time, they very often actually state that no messenger can be sent after their messenger. Maybe it is true that after the Prophet Muhammad there cannot be, but it is surely the contention of the Christian community toward the Islamic community. That after Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father except through him, and that no one can add to the prophecies of this book. There are reasons why the Christian community often will not even look at the Prophet Muhammad. And yet the Christian community itself should turn and treat the concerns that the Jewish community has, which is, well, no prophet's going to come after Moses. I am a disciple of 
Moses, I do not wish to be a disciple of Jesus. This is referencing the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verse 27, if anybody wants to know. So they're stating, they actually state in the New Testament, well, I don't want to be actually a disciple of Jesus. I'm a disciple of Moses. Why? Because they're told they're supposed to hold to Moses. So when a Muslim looks at what they would say to the Christian and to the Jew, is that understanding then taken in and then understood and connected with psychologically and emotionally so that when they hear of a message after the Prophet Muhammad, are they willing to pause and take a breath and treat it as they would ask the Jew to treat Christianity and the Christian to treat Islam? We'll continue on this later. Behold how the sovereignty of Muhammad, the messenger of God, is today apparent and manifest amongst the people. You are well aware of what befell his faith in the early days of his dispensation. What woeful sufferings did the hand of the infidel and erring, the divines of that age and their associates, inflict upon that spiritual essence, that most pure and holy being. How abundant the thorns and briars which they have strown over his path. All treated him as an impostor and pronounced him a lunatic and a calumniator. Such sore accusations they brought against him that in recounting them, God forbiddeth the ink to flow our pen to move, or the pages to bear them. These malicious imputations provoke the people to arise and torment him. And how fierce that torment, if the divines of the age be its chief instigators, if they denounce him to their followers, cast him out from their midst, and declare him a miscreant. Hath not the same befallen this servant, and been witnessed by all. Baha'u'llah here is referencing a part of Islamic history that especially in the West most people are not uh, aware of, which is how horrendously the people of Mecca and the Prophet Muhammad's own extended family uh, treated him. How much was the isolation and the persecution and the horrible and vile treatment towards the Prophet Muhammad in his day? Yet it says, Behold how the sovereignty of Muhammad, the messenger of God, is today apparent and manifest among the people. Baha'u'llah is saying, okay, contrast these two. Look at how much influence the Prophet Muhammad has now. Look at actually how many minarets sing out his call to humanity. And then I want you to look at how the Prophet Muhammad was treated in his day. Let's let Baha'u'llah speak again for a moment. Consider how great is the change today. Behold, how many are the sovereigns who bow the knee before his name. How numerous the nations and kingdoms who have sought the shelter of his shadow, who bear allegiance to his faith and pride themselves therein. From the pulpit top there ascendeth today the words of praise, which in utter lowliness glorify his blessed name. And from the heights of minarets there resoundeth the call that summoneth the concourse of his people to adore him. Even those kings of the earth who have refused to embrace his faith and to put off the garment of unbelief, nonetheless confess and acknowledge the greatness an overpowering majesty of that day star of loving kindness, such as his earthly sovereignty, the evidences of which thou dost on every side behold. Baha'u'llah here is asking us to pay very close attention to a self-evident theme, which is what? How many sovereigns bow the knee to the name of the Prophet Muhammad? And not just sovereigns in this day who even just pay lip service, but over, over the past 1400 years. How the dominion and sovereignty of the Prophet Muhammad has been extolled, his cause wrung out, 
his life studied and he himself beloved by people for nearly a millennia and a half. But to take that fact, which seems often to, to give us a sense of how almost self-evident it was in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, how he was a prophet of God, but then suddenly to remember how he was actually treated. The same thing often happens for all of us when we consider, say, for example, Christ, if we are from the Christian community. We see this you know, massive tidal wave of Christianity rolling over the face of history and really, really conquering Europe. Where from church after church, the bells and hymns were sung in his name. And in some sense, it's interesting because often we confuse this and we infuse it back into the history of Jesus Christ. Where we see this picture of how this rolling, rolling call to prayer that actually constantly encircles the globe in the name of the Prophet Muhammad. And we infuse that glory and grandeur and sovereignty of their cause back into the history of the person of the Prophet Muhammad. And in each case, that's... That's just not what happened. They were actually treated horribly by the vast majority of people. They were persecuted and in some cases killed. And Baha'u'llah is asking us to remember this fact because the ability to see the grand and beautiful, if you will, tree in this current day is very obvious. But we have to be able to see, well, how did they see that great and glorious tree in the seed of the cause of the Prophet Muhammad in his day. How is it they could see that the minarets would sing? How is it they could see that actually all the sovereigns would bow their knee? How could a Jew in the, in the time of Jesus Christ have seen the massive mustard tree in the mustard seed and see that this cause would actually promote the interests of the Jewish people, that it would actually forward the law of Moses even if not in the way of the Jewish divines believe. It is this that we have to try to understand. That's what actually Baha'u'llah is asking us to do. He continues. It is evident that the changes brought about in every dispensation constitute the dark clouds that intervene between the eye of a man's understanding and the divine luminary, which shineth forth from the dayspring of the divine essence. Consider how men for generations have been blindly imitating their fathers and have been trained according to such ways and manners as has been laid down by the dictates of their faith. Were these men, therefore, to discover suddenly that a man who has been living in their midst, who, with respect to every human limitation, has been their equal, had risen to abolish every established principle imposed by their faith, principles by which for centuries they have been disciplined, and every opposer and denier of which they have come to regard as infidel, profligate, and wicked. They would of a certainty be veiled and hindered from acknowledging his truth. Such things are as clouds that veil the eyes of those whose inner being hath not tasted the salsabil of detachment, nor drunk from the cathar of the knowledge of God. Such men, when acquainted with those circumstances, become so veiled that without the least question, they pronounce the manifestation of God as infidel and sentence him to death. You must have heard of such things taking place all down the ages and are now observing them in these days. It behoveth us, therefore, to make the utmost endeavor that by God's invisible assistance, these dark veils, these clouds of heaven-sent trials may not hinder us from beholding the beauty of his shining countenance and that we may recognize him only by his own self. Once again, whether Baha'u'llah is true or not, he is pointing out a historical sociological fact that he is asking us to really, really consider. 
that individuals are trained in such ways and manners, have been laid down the dictates of their faith. And if they were to suddenly discover that a man, who with respect to every human limitation is their equal, has risen to abolish the established principles imposed by their faith, and then it says, by which for centuries they have been disciplined, every opposer and denier of which they have come to regard as infidel, profligate, and wicked, they would automatically reject him. And this is that same theme of trying to separate the glorious sovereignty manifested currently in our day by such individuals as the Prophet Muhammad, who sovereigns have bowed the need to literally for over a millennia, and separate that grandeur and sovereignty, the sovereignty where church bells rang all across the European continent and the Asian continent within the Greek uh, Russian Orthodox Church, and actually try to say, well, wait a minute, okay, but what actually happened? What actually happened is, if you place yourself in that position, suddenly some individual that you knew may have grown up with claimed to be a radiant light of God in your day. And this individual then actually stands up and actually, what does it say? Abolished, established, and principles imposed by your faith. And this is a theme that recurs over and over in the writings of Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha and the Bab, is that suddenly Jesus Christ took what everyone believed would be an eternal law and upended it. It's something that actually we have to remember that occurred within the life of the Prophet Muhammad when he changed the Qibla, or where the ritual sacraments and teachings, both of the Jewish and the Christian faith, suddenly were gone. And a new way of relating to the divine was actually brought forth by the Prophet Muhammad. And that, without least question, these, inf these individuals pronounced those manifestations of God, those revealers of the divine law, as infidel, and sentenced them to death. To summarize this first in a series of studies of the concept of the seal of the prophets and finality in Islam, we first looked at a series of quotes. And those series of quotes were statements by Baha'u'llah that actually confirm that the prophet Muhammad was the seal of the prophets, and that he was the last prophet, in fact, prior to the great day of God. I stated that in order to investigate this topic, we have to be seekers after the Beloved. And that that may <laughs> encompass or include the putting aside of historical interpretations and understandings of our communities and try to just look at the revelation of the Quran and revelations in general with fresh eyes. That while we may have the Hadith and the interpretations of the Islamic community over time, I cannot make that, at least in the initial stages of our investigation, that important. We then looked at the root words, and, uh, of the roots, if you will, of this quote about the seal of the prophets. We looked at the sealer, so to be sealed, having been sealed, and sealed. And what did we find out? I believe it's very clear if we're actually just to look at the Quran itself, to look at the Arabic roots and use the Quran as its own definition, as its own explainer of what it means, that seals are things that are put on, and they do close. Yet there is no reason to actually state that those seals cannot be taken off by God, and that certain kinds of steel, seals like the seal that is placed upon the wine, that the righteous in the end of time in the day of God, actually, will be able to remove a seal and drink of this pure wine. I then looked at uh, a Quran quote, which I had to break up um, <clears throat> from Baha'u'llah, from the Book of Certitude, regarding what I would call this great drumbeat of the Quran. And that drumbeat is that the Quran, out of any of the books I know, 
it has this sort of rhythm that moves through it. And that rhythm is that we consistently have messengers of God, out of the love of God, sent unto humankind throughout all these communities. And these messengers of God, as we'll see in the future, regularly will change aspects of the religion, but also will not always appear according to what we have already assumed they should. That our interpretations often run afoul, and that we then persecute these individuals, and then sometimes kill them. What Baha'u'llah says in this series is that we have to be very careful. If we look, he said, consider Moses, consider Jesus, consider the Prophet Muhammad, and it seems like we're hearing the same drumbeat thumping across the landscape. Be careful for try to separate in your minds the sovereignty and grandeur, for example, that you see in the person of the Prophet Muhammad and his domination of human history for, you know, like a millennia and a half from what actually happened and why these individuals rejected the Prophet Muhammad in his day. Why is it that the Jewish divines rejected Jesus Christ? Why did the Egyptians and even his own people actually reject Moses? And try to learn from these stories and be careful, because many of these individuals were praying for the advent of the Messiah. We're waiting for the coming of the Divine Messenger. So we'll leave this for now. Thank you very much. And we'll be looking at doing the next series in the coming weeks. Thank you very much. Today we're going to look at our second part of our study of the Seal of the Prophets. In the previous video, we examined the meaning of the word to seal. We saw first that the Baha'i writings do not deny that the Prophet Muhammad was the seal of the Prophets, and that that also meant in some ways that the prophetic messages had been closed. One, we're going to look at a passage from Baha'u'llah referring to the Surah of Hud. Then we're going to revisit that notion of the drumbeat of the Quran, and about how we can find these messages to be relevant as believers in the Quranic Revelation. So here we're looking at different themes about the necessity of us to be detached, from our worldly affections, from those things that would pull us away from the examination of a claim of divine revelation from God, and to cease to listen to the words of individuals and the thoughts of men as to our examination of such claims. It then says, look at how many individuals in the past have yearned for and longed for the message of God, for the revelation of God, and yet when it came, they all denied him and turned away from his face, the face of God himself, as seen through the prophets. So here Baha'u'llah asks us to look to the Surah of Hud to try to see this concept that hath been recorded in every sacred book, and that we should ourselves reflect upon that which hath been the cause of such denial. And now, when we look at the Surah of Hud, we're going to see that it is actually a series of stories, examining lives of the prophets of the past, and seeing what was the reason for such denials given to those messengers. So we're going to dive right in. We're going to start uh, in verse 12 of the Surah of Hud. So quickly it seems that it's being stated why no obvious sign was actually sent down, why no manifest angel was actually sent forth. Here we have an accusation of forgery. So it was claimed that the Prophet Muhammad was just creating a forging and forgery and putting it forward as if it was revelation. And the Quran asks, then bring forth ten surahs like it. So we have this notion of why hasn't a self-evident sign, some treasure been sent down, why wasn't an angel sent down, this is nothing but a forgery, and then it's stating that these are those individuals who would hinder others by trying to find something crooked in the straight path. Here, the accusation is, is that the Prophet Muhammad is just a man like them. In some sense, echoing this, well, where's the obvious sign? Why, why hasn't an angel been sent down? You're just like us. But as well, that nor do we see any following thee, but the meanest among us, in the simplest. Lesser people following the Prophet Muhammad, in, and in judgment they're immature. And nor do we see in you any merit above us. 
that they're looking at the Prophet Muhammad and saying, well, there, I don't see anything greatness that you have that I do not have. It's interesting here. In verse 28, it's stating that if a clear sign has been sent, then maybe it actually has been obscured unto that individual, but that God will not force or compel someone to accept the revelation of God. A theme that we see in all scriptures. The Quran repeatedly states, if we had wished we could have made you all one community, we could have made you all believers, but God allows individuals to choose. So here it's saying, is it possible that the sign hasn't been obscured unto you, that you need to actually look for it, that you need to examine it, and that you're not going to be compelled to accept it, or even to examine it, if that is something you're averse to. Freedom is given unto humankind. So there's this accusation coming along, if we're taking stock of them, that there should be, why wasn't some obvious sign sent? Why not an angel sent down? This is nothing but a forgery. That there are individuals who are trying to take that which is straight and trying to find something crooked about it so that others will not listen. They're stating that the Prophet Muhammad, or the messenger of God in this case, is but a man like ourselves, right? That only lesser people follow him and they have no merit. They're immature in their judgment. And then the Quran is saying, well, what if actually there is a sign that has been given to you, but it's obscured you, and it's not going to be forced upon you, you're going to have to examine it. We now move on to verses 48 and 49. This is the announcements of the unseen. This is about Noah and Hud. When you actually look at the Surah of Hud, it's a series of prophetic stories. Tales revealed in the Quran about the prophets of old. And these are referred to as Naba or Anba. That's the Arabic root. And this concept is going to come up later. So these are the announcements about Noah and Hud and the prophet Muhammad. And this is what the Surah of Hud is. It is, in a sense, a role of different prophets of God that have come to humankind and been rejected. And as Baha'u'llah said, a review, if you will, of the reasons why they were rejected. So I bring this up. One, we have again the story of Hud sent to the people of Ad. And the claim is that no clear sign has actually been sent to them. And that they're not the ones to desert their historical gods, the religion of their forefathers, right? And then in the response, it stated, well, if you turn away, I have conveyed the message, and you will be changed for another people if you refuse to accept it. So it's interesting. One, it's stating you were one of us, and you're actually one of us that was previously admired. Yet you're now attempting to take us away from the faith of our forefathers. And this is the rejection of Saleh by the people of Thamud. Jumping forward. The rejection of Shwaib by the people of Midian. It's as if Shwaib here and Saleh Bahor and Hud before, etc., is somehow violating the current religion of these people, and they're being taken away from it. Here, however, it's also being said that you're asking us to leave off our own property. So you're now actually asking us to sacrifice our own material wealth. You're asking us to do things we do not like. And that in the end, you yourself have no temporal power, no physical authority, no high standing. You are of the lowly ones. Once again, this same objection being echoed. You're actually being sent unto Pharaoh with authority, but they still actually listen to Pharaoh. So these stories that have actually been told within the Surah of Hud, of Moses, of Noah, of Shweib, right? Of Saleh, they're being told as an exhortation, as a message of truth unto those who believe, so that they can remember them, that they can learn from them. So these anba, these tales, these stories, these prophetic stories, are being given as a lesson. And Baha'u'llah actually has asked us to examine this surah, and that it alone will suffice it for those who have understanding. I have another example, just quickly, and this is again this, this concept of the Naba. 
the, the tidings, the, the stories of the prophets. It's almost like a mini surah of Hud. <laughs> and this is in uh, the 14th surah. Why I bring this up, why I said it's like a mini surah of Hud, is that the message does come. It comes actually with obvious signs. But the claim is that there is no clear signs. Remember in the Surah of Hood, it talks about it being obscured from us that we would have to investigate and explore. That again, the statement that, well, you're just humans like us. Now, why wasn't an angel sent? Why not some manifest obvious sign? And again, the refrain of the Surah of Hood, that what if it is obscured unto you, it is something you actually have to investigate. So God bestows grace on those he pleases. In this case, upon, in the view of these people, a simple human. That they cannot show that sovereignty except by the permission of God. And I would add from the Surah of Hood that it won't be unbelievably manifest, for his signs will not be forced upon anyone. That you must place your trust in God and not the faith of your forefathers. I think all the, the, the if you will, the rebuttals of the people were actually answered. So they have this belief that the actual true religion, the true revelation from God, can be crushed by force out of their land, or that people can be by force turned back to the true religion. That these objections come that there is not some obvious sign, no manifest angel, no clear sign given. Yet at the same time, the Quran states that, well, possibly this sign has been obscured from you, and none will compel you to examine it. The messengers of God can only show the sovereignty by the permission of God himself. It's stated, well, we don't understand the concepts you preach. And there's also an accusation of forgery. Yet the Quran in the Sword of Hood says, yet there are those who seek for something crooked in that which is straight, to lead others away. There are no humans, or sorry, they are humans like ourselves. They have no merit greater than one of us, right? So once again, this you know the concept of a prophet hath no honor in his hometown. That you're just one of us. We saw you. You grew up just like us. We know this person. And then that other issue of, well, even just the lowest of a, among us actually follow you. And again, this is something that we see within the New Testament. So there's this concept of you're a human just like us. Why hasn't this manifest angel come? You're one just like us. The lowly among us are following. You have no special standing in our community. But it's actually here in the Quran it's saying, but God bestows his grace upon those whom he wishes. We have a repeated refrain that people has, it would state, yes, but I'm following the religion of my forefathers. This is what we've always done. This is the tradition of our community. And you're giving us something new and innovative. We don't understand it, right? So if we're going to actually make this you know, leap, if you will, it has to be self-evident. Why wouldn't an angel be sent down? They all sort of loop in on each other. <laughs> what I really wish to do here is to call attention to a concept I brought up in the previous video. I called it the drumbeat of the Quran. Baha'u'llah asks us to look at the Surah of Hud. And that it alone would suffice for those who are willing to listen. And the Surah of Hood, and this mini Surah of Hood, if you will, is actually that drumbeat. That a messenger is sent, they are rejected, and they are rejected for a series of reasons. Some of the ones we have just gone over. And that this really seems to be sort of, if you will, the drumbeat or the heartbeat of the Quran. A recurring motif of messengers being sent unto humankind from God and those communities actually rejecting them. Now, I'm going to add just a couple quotes here, and then we're going to look at why I think this is so vitally important. There's a quote we often see, especially within Baha'i studies, that the words of God could never be exhausted in the writing, even if all the oceans were ink. Even if we added another full ocean of ink. And it's interesting that right after, right after this quote, it says, say I am but a man like yourself. This concept we just actually 
heard of in the Surah of Hud, of his accusation of you're nothing but a man, and there's no obvious sign. So keep that in mind. If all the trees on earth were pens, and seven oceans of ink, it would not exhaust the words of God. Okay? I want to actually tie this for a moment to this Surah of Hud, which is this series of lessons, and I'm going to go back to read this one section, right? And at the very end, in uh, verse 20, 120 of the Surah of Hud, we relate to these, to thee of the Anba, or Naba, the story of the messengers. With it we make firm thy heart. So these stories that were just told in the Surah of Hud, we make firm thy heart. In them there cometh to thee the truth, as well as an exhortation and a message of remembrance to those who believe. We're also told that the words of God, in their revealing, in their writing, can never be ended. So I now want to bring up the concept, what I would call the irrelevant lesson. Okay? What I mean by that is, when you go through all of these stories told in the Surah of Hud, about this community that rejected their prophet because they said, oh, he's just a man. Or, well, he hasn't given us a clear enough sign. Or, why wasn't there an angel? And I'm suggesting that this is, in some sense, if you will, the drumbeat of the Quran itself, where we constantly have these stories. The Surah of Hud is just a small snapshot that Baha'u'llah has asked us to take a look at. That it starts telling us, well, the prophets are sin. And then what happens is, is that for a series of reasons, they reject their prophet. They deny a true revelation of God and persecute a people in doing so. So why would I call this irrelevant, an irrelevant lesson? Because in the common conception of the Islamic community, you never need to investigate a future claim of a message coming from God. Therefore, these stories are only to tell you the mistakes other people made, not the mistakes you yourself could make. They are not an exhortation to avoid these kinds of reasoning. So you don't have to worry about hearing a message that might be from God, and then you saying, well, he's just a man like myself. Or, well, it's a forgery. Or, well, you know what, there's no real obvious sign, I don't have to look any further. This is actually what comes out of the position of the common conception of the seal of the prophets that we find within the current Islamic community, the dominant interpretation. And I'll be clear, and I will try to bear it out as best I can, what this suddenly does is make vast sections of the Quran itself completely irrelevant to the one who believes it. The lessons and exhortations, right, the message and warnings that we find within the Surah of Hud, it would mean that if we never have to investigate another claim, those lessons suddenly become irrelevant to me. The notion, in fact, that the words of God are like an ocean of ink that will never be exhausted is not something I have to concern myself with. I don't have to worry about that, even though it says, but I am a man just like yourself, after echoing this notion of the sort of hood. Why? Because in my perception of the, the, the Quran's message, the next revelation of God will be manifest and obvious, and I could never miss it. And this is what I mean by suddenly these become profoundly irrelevant notions. They're really, in some sense, only stories for me to point at former communities and say, look at the errors that they made. Yet I would suggest if we read the end of the Surah of Hud, and in each of these cases where you hear this drumbeat of the rejection of a prior prophet, it's not a story that is an exhortation or a message to someone else. There is truth in it for you as a Muslim. There's an exhortation within these stories 
for you as a believer. Because those who are reading this, these passages, really in the end, are those who have accepted them as true. But I'm going to continue here. And I hope you will allow me to continue so I can attempt to bear this out the best as best I can. We're going to move now to the lesson of Joseph. So why did I start previous to the story of Joseph, or the reference of Joseph? It's because it says something like the fate of the people of Noah, the Ad and the Thamud, of those that came after them, right? That God never wishes injustice on his servants. It's recounting, if you will, this theme, this drumbeat that we heard from the Surah of Hud. And then it says that it's fearing this day when a mutual calling will come. Right? A day when you shall turn your backs and flee, no defender shall you have from God. What is this day? This is actually the day of judgment. This is the in day of ingathering. Right? Any whom God leaves astray, there is none to guide. Okay? And suddenly it jumps and says, And to you there came Joseph, in times gone by, he had clear signs. Right? And then it says, At length, when he died, ye said what? No messenger will God send after him. Thus doth God leave to stray such as transgress and live in doubt. Such as dispute the signs of God without any authority. And it suddenly talks about thus doth God seal up the hearts of every transgressor. So there's this notion that the people of suddenly this concept of, you know, the if you will, the drumbeat of the Quran, it then talks about the day of ingathering, the day of a mutual calling. Then it goes to this story of Joseph, and it says, Joseph was sent, he was sent with clear signs, but what? When he died after him, you said no messenger can come after him, and that this was a cause of transgression. I want now quickly to jump to a quote from Baha'u'llah, and then we're going to review this notion of the irrelevant lesson. What is Baha'u'llah talking about? Well, one, we see that Baha'u'llah is referring to this lesson of Joseph. Yet noting that this is actually an objection that has been put forward by community after community after community. That from the Jewish perspective, the Messiah could not possibly be Jesus Christ. Because the law could not be changed. There could be nothing added nor taken away from the law, which is something that we find within the Torah itself, within the Tanakh. We hear that Christians would not accept the Prophet Muhammad because there could be no other individual to come after that would change the law of the Gospel. Right? Why is this being brought up? Because it's asking, okay, well, you as an Islamic community, when you look, say, for example, that um, no man cometh to the Father except through him. And when we're talking about Jesus Christ in the New Testament, how do you understand that passage? How do you as a Muslim tell the Christian that a revelation of God has come after Jesus Christ? And that that revelation, while it looks quite different, from the revelation of the New Testament is still a communication from God to humankind. If, for example, the New Testament says there's no, under, no other name under heaven by which you may be saved, the name of Jesus Christ, and you as a Muslim are coming and trying to say, well, I understand that, yet at the same time this is a revelation from God. How do you respond to that? How do you respond to the belief of the Christian community that no messenger would come after Jesus Christ until the final, self-evident, obvious, apocalyptic day of God? And in turn, how is it that the Christian themselves will answer the questions of the Jewish community? Right? How do they respond to the notion that they believed that, the, that no major prophet would come after Moses until the day of God? 
Why wasn't there a belief in a sort of suffering servant that you had to find? Why was why did God seemingly on the, on the surface not follow what he had said would happen, which would be this sudden great day of God after the closing, if you will, of the Tanakh? Baha'u'llah actually asks the Muslim community to now look that this is actually a theme that has been going on and on, like in the Surah of Hud. And then it is said that how have you actually sought to explain this to prior dispensations? He talks about there being revealed that which is not in accord with your own desires. That suddenly is undermining, if you will, the station and standing and authority of the present leaders of a religion. Once again, this is the very notions we saw within the Surah of Hud being put forward. This is what revelations of the past have done. The undermining, if you will, of the status, on the surface, of the status and standing of prior leaders of religion. Yet in the end, the full, sole purpose of that revelation was to lift them up, educate them, and bring a new revelation of God. This is the story we see within the Quran. Those divines who seek to find, I'm referring back to the Surah of Hood, crookedness in that which is straight, seek to debar individuals from the path of God, and then Baha'u'llah actually quotes, what? It's a waiting message from which you turn aside. This notion that the clear signs are there, but you will not be forced. And when our clear verses are recited, they say, it's merely a man that would pervert you from your father's worship, and it has been forged. What is it doing? I believe Baha'u'llah is clearly saying to the Islamic community, and by default to the Christian and the Jewish community, etc., be careful that you are not using the exact same quick, if you will, brush offs to forestall your own deeper investigation of a possible revelation from God unto humankind in the same way that people of old have done. This is why, for me, the Surah of Hood is not an irrelevant. <laughs> lesson, nor the drumbeat of the Qur'an unimportant. This notion of revelation given, brushed off by the people, rejection, and then judgment. That's what I mean by that constant drumbeat of the Qur'an. That it's actually trying to make it a prominent exhortation. This is uh, Surah 11, 120, Surah of Hood, and verse 120. A prominent exhortation, a lesson, and a message and truth unto the people of the Qur'an itself. So it's saying, give ear unto God's holy voice. Hear the message of God from the Qur'an. And I would add from the New Testament and from the Tanakh, from the Hindu and from the Buddhist scriptures, that these messengers come at intermittent times. They get rejected. And they get rejected often by the means of brushing off investigation, no clear sign, not an angel, no manifest obviousness, nothing but a man like myself. These individuals that are following are more lowly and of ill repute. So the Quran is saying, and Baha'u'llah is asking the individual to listen to the Quran on this central concept that we see, if you will, echoed over and over again and summarized within the Surah of Hud. I think, too, when we look at the Qur'an, we will see many, many different concepts that actually start to come forward once we consider the possibility of a revelation from God coming after the Prophet Muhammad that is itself the day of God. That actually has to be investigated. The central theme that we find in these examples is this. No change wilt thou find in the practice of God. Or for example, such has been the practice of God in the past, no change wilt thou find in the ways of God. This is also a refrain that we actually find throughout the Quran, repeated over and over. This idea to look to the way that God has unfolded his message unto humankind in the past, 
the way he has dealt with humanity in the past, and to take this as a lesson, a lesson, an exhortation, as a truth and a message. Verse 120 from the Sword of Hood. To take this as, if you will, the archetype of what you have to learn in relationship to the way that God communicates. This is something we'll investigate much more deeply, for example, when we look at how the Jewish community saw Christianity. Christianity came in a way that was extremely difficult for the Jewish community to accept. It didn't come in the way that they expected. It did things that were quite strange to it. Yet at the same time, they were asked to investigate it and explore it. Not often thought of, but I would guarantee that if you yourself were an individual who had followed the faith of saintly Abraham in the day of Moses, that the Jewish religion that came out of Moses after the Exodus would be quite different from the religion that you would have, if you will, grown up with from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet it was a revelation of from God unto humankind. That this is actually the norm that we get very attached to the religion that we have, that is part of our heritage. We get a series of you know, fundamental understandings and central doctrines that we believe to be you know, absolutely essential and vital to the revelation, say, of Moses or Jesus or the Prophet Muhammad. And there becomes a culture built up around it. And very often the reasons why we believe those things are not questioned. Then comes a messenger. That messenger suddenly comes in a way we didn't expect, and a great deal of us <laughs> humans then turn to that messenger and reject them because they're upsetting, if you will, the social order. That they're trying to take us away from the religion of our forefathers. That they're saying things that don't jive, if you will, with our own passions and likes, or with our own favored doctrines. That's why the people have learned, the learned people, what Baha'u'llah is actually referring to in the passage just read. And then suddenly, we sort of brush it off. Well, there's no clear sign. It's a forgery, etc., etc. The accusation against Jesus by the Jewish community, against the Prophet Muhammad by the Jewish and Christian community, against Saleh, Shweb, Noah, etc. That the, here the Quran is asking us to learn this message, to learn this pattern, and that you will not find any change in the ways of God. Whereas the common conception, this irrelevant lesson, and the change, is that, well, you don't actually really have to learn the reasons for the rejection of prior prophets. These aren't really important to you as a Muslim, which I find rather odd, given I, it is the drumbeat to me of the Quran itself, trying to get you to learn this lesson over and over and over. The Surah of Hud being a quick drum roll of that central theme. I think too that when we take into account the idea that there are oceans of ink that would be needed, endless oceans of ink, endless pens to carve out the words of God, this itself becomes somewhat of an irrelevant lesson if there's no need for an investigation, there's not going to be any subsequent revelation. Likewise, there shall be no change in his ways. Well, then I, as a Muslim, if I take the common conception that there could not be another revelation that I would have to investigate, well, I actually am expecting a change in his ways. I am expecting a change in his ways, that no more of his words will be written out that I have to find. And the Surah of Hud and the drumbeat of the Quran and its great is not really relevant, nor is the lesson of Joseph relevant to me, because I don't have to worry about that. Sure, the people of you know, Joseph's time, they said no prophet would come after, and they were wrong, but that's not us. And I would suggest that makes the Quran, you know, sorry to not to beat a dead horse, but makes the Quran a very, very peculiar book. It makes it a very, very strange, if you will, revelation from God, because there's all these little nuggets of learning where one can understand, well, how did we fail the last time? Well, how did we brush off a prophet previously? Okay, well, I'm learning the ways that God has communicated in the past, and I can bring that into an understanding so that the next time he communicates with his oceans of ink that are coming, given there will be no change in his ways, that I can then unravel and not miss his next messenger. I think that's the central thesis of the Quran, if you will. I'm going to leave it there. 
And I just want to read a quote. And this comes back to the original uh, topic um, of the seal of the messengers, the seal of the prophets. And we're going to pause here and we're going to have another video coming up where we investigate this very deeply. Um, but I'm going to start with this. This is one of the quotes where, remember, we looked at seal in the past uh, video. And in that video, we found that seal cannot mean necessarily that nothing could come after. Seals can be taken on, put on, sorry, put on and taken off by God. It's the quote here that is uh, the one in question. The actual quote in question, which is from Surah 33, verse 40. Muhammad is the father of no man among you. He is the apostle of God and the seal of the prophets. Surely God has knowledge of all things. It's interesting that it never actually states that he's the seal of the messenger. And while some might say, well, you know, the wise make a big deal of this. <laughs> it never says he's the seal of the messengers. Right? But just the seal of the prophets. I think at the exact same time, it's often sort of brushed off and not really acknowledged that he is the seal of the prophets, and it could have said he is the seal of the prophets and the messengers, and it doesn't. Now, what I would suggest is given that, that this is a revelation from God, this can't be unimportant. What we have to look at, I believe, is an examination of what theoretically could give us an understanding about why the Prophet Muhammad is in fact the seal of the prophets, that it has been sealed and will not be opened until the great day at the end of time, right, by God himself. But at the same time, that seal can be opened by the righteous in that day where they can drink of that pure wine, that pure wine seal that we saw in the Quran in the first examination of the doctrine of the concept of seal. And we'll see that we will see that these are the same thing, and that they relate to the drumbeat of the crime, to the surah of hood, to the objections that are often posed against prior prophets that are also posed against Ahala. But we will leave that for our third section, our third part of the wicked man, which is studying the concept of the wicked man and the news that he brings. Thank you very much. Welcome back, friends. Today we're starting our third part of our investigation into the concept of the seal of the prophets in Islam. The objection that after the Prophet Muhammad, no revelation of God can come to humankind. We've looked at first the meaning of seal. We've then looked at what I call the drumbeat of the Quran, which is how you have this concept that constantly God sends prophets of God unto humankind, and they are then rejected. The last time we looked at the Surah of Hud, and what I call the irrelevant lesson, the idea that the Quran tells us over and over again these tales of how a message came from God to humankind, and how humankind then rejected that prophet of God, and was punished therefore, or judged by God for doing so. And how, for myself, looking at the Quran from the, how would you say, the common concept of how no revelation can come after the prophet Muhammad that needs to be investigated, this suddenly makes these passages of the Qur'an, as I said, irrelevant to the reader. Why? Because you don't have to learn why people have rejected prophets in the past. You don't have to learn from their mistakes and then carry them forward into your life as a spiritual being in a relationship with God. We then touched upon how there are other passages of the Qur'an, for example, how Joseph, the tale of Joseph that we looked at, that it itself teaches that though these people of the past disputed about Joseph, then came to believe in him, and then in the end, after he passed, stated that no independent message of God could actually come to humankind after Joseph, and that this is what sealed their hearts, like the seal of the prophets. And how the words of God are like oceans of ink that could be written out with pens. That if we were to take all the trees of the world, and we were to actually turn them into pens, and all of the oceans were to be transformed into ink, that would not exhaust the writing of the words of God. At the end of the last section, we read the passage from the Quran, Surah 33, verse 40, that is, if you will, the genesis of this idea of the seal of the prophets, which we've looked at several times. 
It is. Muhammad is the father of no man among you. He is the apostle of God and the seal of the prophets. Surely God has knowledge of all things. I stated that it is interesting that it says not that he's the seal of the messengers, that he's the seal of the prophets. I also acknowledge that oftentimes uh, those of the Islamic community think that the Baha'is make, if you will, too much of the fact that he is not the seal of the messengers, but is only the seal of the prophets. And I said that for myself, I can empathize with this, and at the same time too little is made out of it from the Islamic community themselves. Because it cannot be unimportant that he is the seal of the prophets, and not the seal of the messengers, that he is the apostle of God and the seal of the prophets. Um, and this is what leads us into our second phase of our investigation, or sorry, the third phase of our investigation. What I also acknowledge, both in the prior two videos, is that the Baha'i writings, it is really, really important to understand, never contest the claim that the Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. In no way does it ever state that he is not the last messenger of God prior to the great day of God, prior to the day of ingathering, the Yom Adin, the final, if you will, the final event that all previous prophets have actually spoken of, which is the coming of the kingdom of God upon earth. This is never contested by the Baha'i writings. I gave passages from Baha'u'llah's writings that acknowledge this. So what is going on? Well, I think this part of the investigation we're going to be looking at now will actually give us an understanding as to why it is that he is the seal of the prophets, but not the seal of the messengers. I think in the short, it's that all previous messengers of God have brought a message unto humankind for their day. A, if you will, using the concept of the divine physician for the Baha'i writings, a medicine that is to treat the malady that is facing the people of that region at that time. But they also have spoken, if you will, of that next covenant of a messenger to come, and also of the great day of God that is distant upon the horizon, when actually God will come and dwell with mankind, when actually the revelation of God will fill the earth. This is a passage, which is from the 49th chapter of the Quran, and it says that if a wicked man comes to you, bringing news, examine it, lest through ignorance you harm a people, and then afterwards have to repent. And actually, in, in some sense, the rest of this video and even part of a subsequent, if I cannot get through it all today, is actually just an investigation of this passage and related passages that connect to it. And I, would, I will be uh, frank, it is largely because of this passage and the potentialities that lie enshrined within it and how it reaches out into other passages of the Qur'an that to me the common interpretation within the Islamic community that one need not be careful of a possible revelation of God coming that you would have to investigate and accept cannot possibly be true. That sounds quite bold, but we're going to go through it. So let's first start with the passage in question. And I'm going to read the context because I think not only is the passage that Baha'u'llah is quoting vital to our understanding, but also the context around it. To sort of sum up, if you will, do not raise your voice above him, lower your voice instead, you should wait out, uh, you should be patient with God's apostle, not calling out to him from the streets. And then it says, suddenly, um, if a wicked man come to you, right, with some news, verify it, lest you harm a people in ignorance and later have to repent. And then it says, if God were to, have to that God's apostle is among you, right, and that if he were to follow you, you would certainly fall into misfortune. But God has endeared faith to you, has made it beautiful, and has made hateful to you unbelief, wickedness, and rebellion. And then it goes back to this concept about how two uh, groups of the faithful actually are in contention, right? Make peace between them. Why I bring up the passage in all of its context is one is because uh, the surface oddity of it. When one looks at it, it seems as if there's one topic going on, which is the treatment of the disrespect, if you will, shown to the, the Apostle of God 
Prophet Muhammad. And then suddenly this passage about a wicked man coming to you with news, and this idea of contention and conflict within the community. Now, there's another reason to bring this up, because if you actually look online and you examine, if you will, objections to Islam, you will find actually that in certain places this passage is actually ridiculed from those who are, if you will, naysayers of the Islamic revelation. Why is that? The way it's often portrayed is, well, obviously people were, you know, talking over the Prophet Muhammad, they were actually, you know, taking, you know, if you will, place in front of him, they were treating him disrespectfully, so all of a sudden the Prophet Muhammad comes up with a revelation from God where suddenly they have to be more respectful. Um, and we do know, at least from the, so the, the historical sources, that oftentimes the, the Muslim community uh, treated the Prophet Muhammad as if he were like a buddy. Right here it says, do not call out to him from the apartments, like, Ya, yo, ya Rasulullah, <laughs> like calling out and asking him to come out. Um, that they should be patient, they shouldn't be calling out to him and demanding him to come, they shouldn't be talking over him. So there really is this concept of, uh, if you will, the, the Prophet's among them and they're, and they're treating him as if he's like a chum, like a buddy. Um, as opposed to someone deeply, deeply worthy of respect because he is God's Apostle. So at this point I want to really zoom in on this passage and begin to understand the Quranic passage in verse 6 on its own terms. I want to look first at this section where it says, If a wicked man or profligate person comes to you with news. And know that it's saying, O ye who have faith. So under the believers, if, an, if a wicked person comes to you with news, verify it, examine it, or tabayyana, to make it clear, lest you should visit harm or harm a people out of ignorance. So what is this term news? The term in the Quran itself is naba. So this, for those who may not have seen previous videos, um, or have, may have forgotten, we're going to be looking at the Arabic roots of Naba in the Quran to try to understand what this and other terms within this passage actually mean, independent of how individuals use it, say, in everyday Arabic language, or how other people have used this term. We want to see, from the perspective of the Quran, using it as, if you will, an empirical source, how that term is used by God in the Quran. To unveil the meaning therein. Okay? So this root, naba being the singular or anba being the plural, gives it comes from the same root. Um, often naba is actually translated as news or tiding or story or tale, but it's also the same root as a prophet or prophecy or to reveal. So what we're going to be doing is, is taking a concordance, looking every time that this root appears that has been used in the if a wicked man come to you with naba and try to unfold if you will a drop down menu of all the instances that this actually appears okay the first is from chapter 5 verse 27 so what is this this is the story of the son of adam so this is a naba about cain and abel from the old testament and i'm going to run through these quite quickly um and all the passages will actually be in the PDF under the video, but I want to try and roll through them, if you will, to get a sense of what this term is meaning. So this is a naba about Cain and Abel. Uh, it is assumed often that this is actually referring to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 4. So this is, again, the story of David, the anointed one, the beloved of God. We have Cain and Abel, we have David, and we have the story of Abraham. If you will, the Neba Ibrahima. But we have this individual who God has revealed his signs unto, right? And this is a story about this individual. So has not this naba, this tiding, this news, this story of those who came before reached the people? And what are those? The people of Noah, of Ad, of Thamud, of Abraham, the men of Midian, and the cities overthrown, right? To them came their messengers with clear signs. So once again, we have this concept of uh, Abraham, Noah, Shweib, Saleh, right? We have all these uh, prophetic figures. Chapter 10, verse 71. Relate unto them the story of Noah. Relate unto them 
the Naba of Noah. So we have, again, another prophetic figure. It's saying that whenever they see a sign from God, they say, ah, this is nothing but magic. This is like when we were looking at, if you will, the Surah of Hud, and one of those objections that are put forth by those unto whom comes a message from God. And then it says they reject such warnings, right, and follow their own lusts. And this is the story, again, that we see from the Surah of Hud, where individuals will follow their own desires as opposed to the truth because one benefits them more. And then it says already there have come to them recitals. And what are these recitals? They are wisdom, mature wisdom, right, that they can actually check the truth of. These are, if you look into the passage and the surrounding material, messages from God from the past. Tidings, if you will, that have, uh, but the warners profit them not, right? It was the purpose of the Prophet Muhammad to actually warn the people. I am but a warner, he says. So once again, we have this concept of the Nabat being actually applied to messages from God, unto those who we sent our signs, unto those who we sent to warn Abraham, Lot, Noah, etc. So what are these recitals? Well, actually what we have here is, once again, a mini surah of Hud, if you will, in uh, Surah 54. We start with the story in verse, verse 9 of Noah, but they said before them the people of Noah rejected their messenger. It continues on, we have, for example, in 17 to 26, we have the people of Ad and Thamud, right? It says that, you know, the people of Ad rejected the truth, how terrible was my penalty. It then continues on, those of Thamud also rejected their warners. And then continues on, we go into, from Surah, sorry, Surah 54, <laughs> verses 32 to 37 and 40, we actually have the people of Lot. This is what, um, why I said it's kind of like another Surah of Hood. We actually have all of these recitals, and what are those recitals? Those are the recitals of prior unveilings of God to humankind. These are the recitals that they can check the revelations sent previously. And it ends in the chapter 40, why I noted that quote is because it says, and we have indeed made the Quran easy to understand and remember. Then is there any that will receive admonition? Are there all, and I would suggest this is what it is saying. Look at this, what has happened in the past. Look that we have sent these workers all the way through Surah 54. These, there are recitals here that you can check. There are anbat that you can investigate. And this is easy to understand. We have sent messengers to you before. You actually have rejected them. And a punishment came upon the community. And are there any, it says, who will receive this admonition? And this is what I meant about the, irre the irrelevant lesson in the previous video. When we actually look at these passages, do we actually see for us a message? That we have to be very careful that we don't say, oh, this is nothing but transient magic. He's nothing but a man like myself. Well, why don't you bring some apocalyptic, unfathomable sign unto us that it can be made obvious that you are a messenger of God. Those are lessons, admonitions here, that actually the Islamic community, those who follow the Quran, O ye who believe, must take into their hearts. But that itself can only be meaningful or important if it's possible that you could do it again. You don't warn an, a group of people about something that could never happen to them. You don't admonish them about something that they don't need to change. Again, we'll continue on. This is a story that we relate unto you. Okay? So, and when we continue, what do we have? We actually have here uh, the story of those who were punished by God for rejecting their messengers. And then it continues to go to the story of Moses. So in this case, we relate stories. So in these last two examples, for example, in uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 101 and up to 109, and verse 20, 99 to 101, what are these stories? What are these anba? What are these, this, these tidings? Well, these are actually tidings being directly given by God to humankind. So God here in the Quran is saying, this is a tiding, and this tiding, once again, is my message unto you. And what are the stories that we actually find? Well, we find out that there are actually stories about Moses and Pharaoh and the story of the calf. So the coming of Moses unto Pharaoh, that revelation unto Pharaoh, 
and the testing of Pharaoh, and then also the story of the calf, which is actually when Moses is on Mount Sinai receiving revelation, and how the people turned away from the truth of God under the, to a golden calf of their own design. Uh, chapter 28, verse 3. We rehearsed to thee some of the story of Moses and Pharaoh, the Naba, Musa, al Pharaoh. The story of Moses and Pharaoh. Again, that same thing. Where do we find that story? We find that story in the Old Testament. We find it referenced reference with the New Testament, and we find that story once again within the Quran. These are the stories related unto humankind by God through his messengers. When it says you have already received the account of these messengers, that word is the account is Naba, so recitals, tidings, news, account. But what is that account? That is a revelation of the life of prophets and their rejection by community for selfish desires. That lesson that isn't irrelevant, I'm contending, that is actually vital for those who are the readers of the Quran to take into their heart. What is this again? This is the drumbeat of the Quran. This is potentially an irrelevant lesson, right? Because you have that there is a message that has already been told to you. A revealing from God to humankind, an Abba from God to humankind. Or at least a story about what? What is, the, what is the news? What is the tidings? What is the recital about? About a community who had a message come to them from God. Once again, in every instance so far that we've seen, it's of this category. That that message came to them and they rejected. And once again, what do we see? We have a reason for rejection. Shall a mere human being direct us? That is exactly like the theme that we've seen several times in this video, and that we saw when we were examining the Surah of Hud in part two of the Seal of the Prophets. That a message comes from God unto humankind, and there's a whole host of rejections listed within the Quran. Well, why doesn't he come with some manifest obvious sign? Why does an angel come down? Why doesn't he come down with a, with a glorious book radiating between his hands? Well, we already knew this person. We've known him our whole life. This individual is a mere human. I'm not going to follow him. Look at the people that are actually following them. They're very lowly. They have no standing in our community. And this individual has no obvious manifest power. These are the resounding and repeating rejections within the Quran that are recorded in the Quran which cannot be an irrelevant lesson. And here it's saying these are the stories, right, of those who rejected the Naba. What does the Naba relate to? Up to this point, nothing ever except the revelation of God unto humankind. And it encodes repeatedly over and over the rejection of humankind by not truly investigating and harming a people. So the next category, again, we are still looking at instances of the word naba or plural and ba, which is translated so far as stories, tales, recitals. And in this case it's it tells in chapter 12 verses 190 verses 99 to 102 of the story of Joseph. And it talks about how when his family come to him in Egypt and lay prostrate before him. What happens is, is as it goes through and it has this conversation between Joseph, right, and God, where he says, O oh my Lord, thou hast indeed bestowed upon me some power. This is in, again, verse uh, 101. And it says, And taught me something of the interpretation of dreams and events. O thou creator of the heavens and the earth, thou art my protector in this world and hereafter. Take thou my soul at death as one submitting to thy will, as a Muslim, and unite me with the righteous. Then in verse 102 it says, Such is one of the stories, and ba, that same root, of what happened, unseen, which we reveal by inspiration unto thee. So in this case, this is a part of the life and story of Joseph, that is being a moment in the life of that blessed individual that is being unveiled to the humankind within the Quran. So this Naba is actually part of the Quran. 
That's actually what it is. We continue. Verse 18, sorry, chapter 18, verses 9 to 17. And this is what's called the youths of the cave, the story of the companions of the cave. Where these enter into the cave, and it says, and I'm not going to go through the whole story, but something it says, where you relate to the their story in truth. We relate to thee their story. So what is it that, and that's the case where we actually have this term, Neba'um, their story. Where is this story being expressed? It's being expressed in the Quran. The relating, the tithing that's coming, the Neba' that's coming, is through a Nabi, a prophet, from God unto humankind. As we continue, chapter 3, verse 44, Okay, here it says, This is part of the tidings of things unseen which we reveal unto you. Where it says, This is the part of this is from the tidings of the unseen, and Ba'al Ghaib, the unseen tidings, the hidden tidings, which we reveal unto ye. And it is actually about Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. Where it says, Behold, the angel said to him, O Mary, God giveth thee glad tidings of a word coming unto from him. His name will be Christ, Jesus, the son of Mary, held in honor in this world and the hereafter. And it says, Thou wast not with them when they cast lots, as to which of them should be charged with the care of Mary. So it's talking about this communication between God and Mary, and a part of the life of Mary that is unseen, that is being revealed. So what is the Naba? or the Anba, the tidings. It's actually the Quranic verses itself. We're now jumping to a section called The Great News. And this is a quite different category. So what do we have so far just to take, if you will, stock of it? We have a whole series of the uses of this term Naba carried out. And they're all about the prophet Abraham, Noah, about the stories of the people of Adam and Thamud. You actually have uh, communications about Joseph, all about prophetic figures related to the life of David. We actually have, if you will, resounding tidings, Naba or Anba, of previous revelations, stories that we find, say, within the Tanakh or within the New Testament. Then you actually have a sub second uh, subset of actually those which are unseen, those which are revealed unto humankind only within the Quran. So the Anba, the tidings, these stories are actually part of the Quran itself. But we're going to move to another section, which is the great news, the great tidings, if you will. What is this day in the Quran? What is this day when the, when the, if you look into the context, where the idols will be asked if they had led astray humankind, where people will be asked of their deeds, and no one will be able to actually, if you will, stand for another? When those who have repented, believed, and worked righteousness and will have their hopes among them who achieve salvation. What, what is the day being talked about here? It's the day of God. So this is the story of the day of God. The tale of the day of God itself is a Naba. So we have story, what does Naba mean so far? Story of prophets, hidden stories that are actually the Quranic revelations themselves, and then the day of God, the story of the day of God, is a Naba. Okay? And a Naba is that which a Nabi brings. It is a prophetic utterance about prophets and about the final day of God. But we're going to move on. Chapter 78, Surah 78 of the Quran, is itself called a Naba. The tiding, the great news. So we're going to actually look at this, Surah seventy-eight, and again, which is titled the Naba, the tiding. So we have an actual surah in the Quran using this term that we find in. If a wicked man come to you with an axe, look into it very carefully, lest you harm a people in ignorance. That word is actually used as a title of a surah of the Qur'an. So let's look at the first four verses. Concerning what are they disputing? 
concerning the great news. Al-Naba al azim the great news, about which they cannot agree. Verily, they shall soon come to know. So I want to jump ahead in Surah 78 to give the context, because it's still talking about this day, this Naba. Verily the day of sorting out is a thing appointed, the day when the trumpet shall be sounded, and ye shall come forth in crowds, and the heavens shall be opened as if they were doors. What is Surah 78 about? What is it referring to? The day of God. It's referring to the ultimate tiding that is to come that the Prophet Muhammad is the Khatam, the seal of. So the Prophet Muhammad comes and he is the seal of the Prophets. What he is actually prophesying about, in which each prior prophetic individual, right, has actually spoken of, is a great Naba that's coming, right? And then we have the Quran in Surah 49, verse 6, saying, if someone comes and tells you that there is a Naba here, look into it carefully, or you might hurt people out of your own ignorance, your own jahaliya, and later have to repent unto God for having done so. Here in Surah 38, okay, what is it talking about? That there is a supreme, that again, starting in verse 65, that the Prophet Muhammad is a warner. He is coming, telling you there is no other God but God, right? That he is exalted in might, and that this is a message, a naba avin. It is a great tiding, okay? And he's saying, from which you are turning away. So what is this talking about? It's the Quran. The great hiding in this instance, not the future one where day humankind will be judged, which is what we just saw in the last section. This is what is judging them now, this great message from which they are currently turning away. And what is that? It's the Quran itself. The revelation of the Prophet Muhammad, the warning that he's bringing. A message supreme. And then what does it say? No reward do I ask for you for this. What, for what? Nor am I a pretender. What is he saying that I'm not asking for some reward for this, this message supreme? It's the Quran. <laughs> the Quran is a Naba. The day of God, we just saw, that great event in the future of which the Prophet Muhammad has come to actually tell you is coming, which Jesus came to all spoke of, which Noah spoke of, which Moa spoke of. This great day is, it, is itself a naba, and the Quran is a naba. It is no less than a message to all the worlds. What is that message to all the worlds? Again, that's, uh, sorry, and that's uh, uh, verse 87. What is it? It's the Quran. Chapter 6, verse 67, we're just rolling up as many as we can to understand what it is that this is actually talking about. For every message there is a limit of time. For every prophecy there is a limit or a term. That's actually often how it's translated. What is that word for every message? Naba. Once again, for every Naba there is a period of time. And note, when it says, when you see man engaged in discourse about that thing, right? And they are doing so disrespectfully. Turn away. Let them do it until they change to a different topic. Okay? What is this message? It's a revelation from God. I was just in this case, it's talking about how the believers react when someone is insulting the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad. Right? Not to be involved in contention. Just previously, what did we see? The Quran is in Naba, the Day of God is in Naba, a prophecy is in Naba, and stories about prophets and unseen revelations never heard before that are ayats, if you will, sort of uh, uh, verses of the Quran itself, are Naba. This is again the same concept. And it wraps all of them together. 
right? If God had wished, he could have sent them a sign that would have made them bend their necks in humility. That they would not have to investigate. That would have been so manifestly obvious that they would be forced to accept it. But there comes not to them a newly revealed message from God that they turn away therefrom. This is the Surah of Hud. This is the drumbeat of the Quran. We send a remembrance, a dhikr, from, from uh, the merciful, right, unto them. But what do they do? They turn away from it. And then it says, they have re indeed rejected the message, but they will soon know the truth of what they mocked. What is that message? What is that message that they have indeed rejected now, right, that they will soon know the truth of, which they mocked? And I would suggest this is obvious, it's the Quran. It's saying, look, if we had wanted, we could have sent a sign unto you that would have forced you to accept, right? But in the past, right, the drumbeat, there comes to them not a newly revealed message, never, and they just they end up rejecting it, right? And they have indeed rejected now, but soon they will know the truth of what they've mocked. And what is that message that they have rejected? A naba. It's the same term again. And honestly, just directly, what is it actually talking? It's talking about the Quran, which we've seen now twice in two other surahs. That the Quran itself is a naba. It has revelation from God. We have yet to encounter at this point any use, and it's important to take stock of this, any use of this term ever so far, where that term is not used to refer to revelation, revelation of stories of the prophets that people have rejected for bad reasons by not investigating, the day of God itself, the great tiding, and the Quran itself. Those are the general categories of how this term is used. Revelation. We're going to continue. Here in the sixth sort of the Quran, it's again the same things. The God created you, He knows your secrets. But then it says, There did not come to them any sign. Any ayat, any ayat, from among the signs of their Lord, but they would disregard it. And then it says, they certainly denied the truth when it came to them in the past, they rejected it, right? But soon there will come unto them the naba or the anba, the tidings that they have been mocking. What in this case is the news, the anba, that they are stating that is in the future, that is actually going to be coming, that they have been mocking? It is the message of the Quran itself that the Prophet Muhammad has been mocked for saying that he is a liar, an imposter, that he made up fables of the ancients, and that they have been saying, we have known you all our life, you're just one of us. Again, refer back to the previous video of the drumbeat of the Quran. This once again is categorizing the revelations and the warnings within the Quran as being the Anba. We're going to pause here and return, actually, to the quote itself. Try to take stock of what it is that we've been seeing so far. And at this moment, I'm going to put a pause because there are two texts we have not looked at. There are actually only two instances in the Quran where this term is used other than those that we have looked at. Okay? For those who wish to look at, one is in uh, so 27, verses 22 to 27, and it is about the story of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. There is another, which is in the Surah 33, verses 20 to 22, that is about the Confederates seeking news of the Prophet Muhammad. I'm going to put them aside, because I want to show why they, uh, how they can actually be used as, if you will, problem text for the theory, and then treat them independently. So I promise that we actually will be going through this, what I want to note here is imagine we have like this 25 different texts that we've actually looked at 
And each of them tells us that a naba, by context, is either stories of prophets, tales of the prophetic lives, and the rejections uh, of individuals on them, unseen news and unseen tidings from God, the day of God, and the Quran itself. So we're going to be taking those as our definitions and pulling them in to look at, say, this one instance, which is about a wicked man coming to you with naba. And we're going to try to use that, if you will, to understand that text. Now someone says, okay, now just imagine these other two texts, the one about the Queen of Sheba and the Confederates seeking news, don't at all refer to revelations from God. So you have on a scale, I, I promise you they do, and we'll look at them, <laughs> but you have on a scale, imagine they don't. And you have a scale, so there's 25 instances. You're trying to find out what this term means. This term naba, this, this, this tidings that some, some person you think is wicked actually might come to you with. You still have to look into it. And you want to try and understand what the term is. So you go over here and you put 25 instances, okay? Roughly 25 instances on a scale. And they actually say, okay, well, what does it mean? Well, it means uh, uh, stories of prophets, news of prophets, uh, revelations of prophets, unseen messages from God, the Quran itself, revelation, verses of the Quran, and the day of God. So all the definitions we have over here are all revelatory in nature. And then you say, okay, but over here there's two instances that, that kind of seem that do not mean that. And, and, as an, and as an individual, as someone who's watching or listening, would you then go, well, oh, then I don't have to look into it. Now, I, I actually don't really have to look. Uh, it, it couldn't mean another revelation of God. It couldn't mean another uh, tale of the life of a prophet. I don't have to look into it that way, so I'm, I'm not going to take the 25 as being the, the fundamental meaning of this term. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab onto these two and, and follow them. And I would suggest that on the one hand, this would be very peculiar, extremely peculiar to do. And I would put this out, well, and we've looked at this in different videos, that this is, this is your way out. This is where you do, you could actually turn and say, well, you know, it, it seems like maybe these 25 or 25 odd cases are telling me that I should, if, if somebody comes to tell me that there is a Naba, a, a, a tithing from God, a story of the unseen, a new Quran, uh, if you will, an apocalyptic revelation of the day of God, that I should look into it very carefully before I harm people, okay? But what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to say, well, no, um, that's not actually what it means. You better watch at this point, because you might say, because you know it's it's not manifest and obvious. It doesn't cause me to bow low my necks, because, you know, like it's such a, an apocalyptic event. Besides, these individuals over here who are claiming to have come of the Naba, you know, they're wicked. Uh, they're just like other people, right? Why didn't they come down with an angel? Why didn't right? You start echoing that irrelevant lesson. You start echoing the Surah of Hood and all these stories. You would then turn and say, well, I'm going to take these two and I'm going to hold them very close to myself and then I'm going to use them so that I don't investigate. I was just, that's exactly how God works. This is your route. We're going to look at these two passages. But what I want to do now, and I said, as I said, we're going to look at the story of the Confederates and the story of Solomon in a subsequent lecture. But at this moment, I really want to focus on back on this text. And I'm only going to do it in the broadest uh, of expressions. I really think it's vital that we look at this. When we go back to Surah 49, verse 6, and we look at its context, remember, O you of faith, do not walk ahead of the messenger of Allah, do not raise your voice above him. Right? Indeed, those who lower their voices in the presence of the apostle of Allah, they are the ones whose hearts God has tested for the fear of God. For them is forgiveness and a great reward. And it's, so it's basically saying, like, don't speak over the brother. Don't actually interrupt him. Don't stand out on the street and call out to him, yeah, you know, Prophet Muhammad, come out here. Treat him with respect. Treat him with dignity. Right? And then suddenly it seems to switch gears. If a wicked man cometh to you, oh, and remember, O oh, ye who have faith. It, it's actually said the same thing previously, right? O oh, ye who believe, O oh, ye who have faith, O oh, ye who have faith, if if a wicked man comes to you with news, look into it. Lest you harm a people out of ignorance, 
and be regretful for what you have done. We're going to look again in a subsequent video at what it means to look into something, to clarify it, to verify it. We're also going to look at what it means to repent and how that word is used in the Quran. And both in the to make clear, to verify or examine carefully, and to repent, I think what you'll find is they're all related to how we treat prophets of God. We'll leave that for now, that's a claim. But then right after this passage it says that among you, within your group, is God's apostle. If he followed your wishes, your desires, he would fall into misfortune. And then it says, but God has endeared the faith to you, has made it beautiful in your hearts. Previously it was not, right? Previously it was not, but God has endeared the faith to you, made it beautiful unto you. And he has made hateful unto you unbelief, wickedness, and rebellion. So there was a time when you weren't endeared to the faith, that it wasn't beautiful to you, and you were more on unbelief, wickedness, and rebellion, but God has made it and changed the situation. And now the prophet of God is among you. As I said at the very beginning of this video, I've seen this, and multiple times, this series of passages mocked. Why? Again, to remind everyone, because it seems like the, 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 all of a sudden these revelations come forward and they're saying, you know, be respectful, be more, you know, treat the prophet Muhammad more pleasantly. And it's seen, very sadly, as a way of the Prophet Muhammad, you know, trying to get a higher standing in the community. I would suggest that these sections are actually completely related. And I'm going to put it this way. Say the individual comes to the community and they say, look, there was a time, and I'm actually starting, if you will, on uh, verse 7. And I'm going to loop around. So there was a time uh, when you were against the Prophet Muhammad. You hated belief, it wasn't endearing to you. And you were in a period of wickedness and rebellion. Right? But God has changed that. He's transformed it to a state where you love the faith. It was endeared to you. And now the Prophet is amongst you. He's in your midst now. Whereas before he was aside and distant. Now I want you to notice something that even now one's belief is beloved and endearing to you. Even now. The Prophet Muhammad's talking and you speak over him. Right? You cut him off and you treat him disrespectfully. You're yelling to him from outside. So even upon recognition of him as a prophet of God, even having moving from hating belief to loving belief, from being against faith to being in faith, you still treat the prophet Muhammad as if he's your buddy. You treat him disrespectfully. You do not accord him the dignity and respect and station that he deserves. So, here's a lesson. If someone comes to you, okay, Claiming to have a revelation from God, a naba. Look at your own past, not just the past of all the revelations of the Quran. Look into your own past and be very careful. Investigate it, right? Because you might actually hurt a people in ignorance, like the times of the Jahaliyyah, a reference that's also in this passage, and later have to repent, okay? Because look at yourselves now, okay? Look at yourselves now. There was a time where you were a hatred, were against belief, you were against the prophet, right? Wickedness and rebellion were your way, but even now, once you've accepted it, you treat him inappropriately. How much more so if you're going to treat how are you going to treat an individual who you see as wicked, who comes to you with a message, right, from before? And the term used in here is a term that is rolling and resounding like the drumbeat of the Quran all throughout the Quran, and is referencing revelations of God, verses of the Quran, is actually the term for the Quran, a supreme message, 
and also references the day of God. This is why, and again this will come up again in the subsequent videos, this is why to me this, if you will, little section from Surah 49 is actually just trying to get the Islamic community to look now not at the story of Abraham, not at the story of Noah, not at the story of Joseph, it's trying to get the Islamic community to look at its own history as a microcosm of the drumbeat of the Quran. And it's trying to say, be careful, you yourselves have treated him with disrespect. How much more when you actually experience the coming of someone who is a wicked individual, who brings a message, a tiding, a claim of a revelation of a prophet, a new Quran of the Day of God. Obviously, if you should do that with a wicked person, how much more an upright, loving, compassionate, and prayerful individual? Again, something to be thought of. Once again, let's look back at, if you will, tying the bot and the drumbeat before we move on. The drumbeat of the crown that we looked at the last time is that we actually have these instances, right, of prophet coming, uh, responses, if you will, that are wise. Wow, well, he's just a man like myself. We've known him since he was a kid. He's an imposter. He's a liar. He's just recounting stories of the ancients, right? Why doesn't he come with a book in his hands, a radiant book, or manifest signs that would make us bow our necks in humility? Why isn't he doing this? Again, these are all things that are said about whether or not they're true, the Bab and Baha'u'llah. These are actually objections made towards the Bab and the Baha'u'llah, and whether or not the Bab and the Baha'u'llah are messengers of God, this is the story of the Qur'an. But then we find out that all these stories that we've been looking at in the Drumbi of the Qur'an are themselves and that They're tidings, they're news, that are defined within the Qur'an as being revelatory tales. Right? The drumbeat is revelatory tales. Then we're like, okay, well that's interesting. And then all of a sudden we're like, wait a minute, these revelatory tales, the, the, that same term, which incidentally you're obviously in the Quran, <laughs> is actually used, this term is actually used to refer to the Quran itself, its own verses, and the day of God. And then we push that us all over, again onto a scale, you right, a scale on both sides, and then we look at it and we say, wait a minute, we got this passage over here. And it tells us that there is in within the Islamic community a period of time of disrespect towards the Prophet Muhammad, even after they believed, these individuals who had been rejecting him, and then it suddenly tells us, be careful, be very, very careful. If someone again in the future comes to you claiming to have a naba, which is the day of God, look into it really carefully. If we take this passage from 49.6 and we see it as actually as a warning, which it certainly seems to be, that you could actually hear a naba, prophetic the scale, prophetic stories, another Quran, right? That suddenly you hear of something coming, but it hasn't come the way you've actually expected it to come, that you better look into it because you could become a new jahaliya, a new time of ignorance, right? And you could actually reject them and hurt this people. Which Islamic community has done to the Babian Baha'i faith. And then you actually then will have to repent for having done so. That seems like something that should really grip one's attention. But then all of a sudden you take this and you say, wait a minute, turning back to the Babian Baha'i faith, they actually acknowledge that the seal of the prophets means there's no revelation between the Prophet Muhammad and the Naba. So this is why he is the seal of the prophets, because between these two events, the revelation of the Naba, incidentally, the Quran, because we saw that it was actually called the Naba, and the Naba, a future day of God, the revelation, the great unveiling, the day of ingathering, when all would be judged. Okay, the Quran's a Naba, there's a Naba coming, nothing will come in before, and this group, the Babi Baha'i dispensation, acknowledges that nothing actually comes between, and that he is the seal of the messengers, what is the Naba that's coming? It has to be this one. It has to be the Naba 
the day of ingathering. But that same term is used for the Quran. So is the day of ingathering the day of resurrection an Abba? Yes. Is the Quran an Abba? Yes. What if they're one? If actually the day of ingathering and the day of resurrection and the great tiding that's coming that he was the seal of the prophets for is an Abba. Well, it is, as is the Quran. It's the advent of a messenger of God who comes bearing a book that can be rejected, that can be harmed, and that his people, out of ignorance, if you don't look very carefully into it, you can harm. And then suddenly all these irrelevant lessons, as I mentioned in the last video, become exceedingly relevant to a believer in the Quran. Suddenly you have to be very careful. Wait a minute, what, did I just say, well, he's nothing but a man, right? You know, the Bob, the Bob and Bahala. And again, it could be somebody else. It doesn't have to be the Bob and Bahala. Wait a minute, I should be really careful because if I say, wow, he's nothing but a man, he looks just like me. Okay, wait a minute. In the drumbeat of the Quran, it has warned me about that. But it has also warned me that a Nabah is coming. I have to be careful. I have to look very carefully and make it very clear what's going on. Okay, okay. Yeah, but there's no many obvious manifest signs that suddenly made me bow my neck low. Ooh, wait a minute. When it re relates to Nabah, and it addresses the issue of, of Nabah, of tidings of the past. Okay, wait a minute. It actually told me that that's actually what they said. Oh, I better be careful. This is not an irrelevant lesson. Okay, okay, okay. So I still have to look into it. Oh, but he didn't come down with a book. He didn't come down with an angel. Right? Well, the people that are following him are merely lowly. Once again, over and over and over, suddenly these become vital and important lessons for the seeker, the lover of God, to incorporate within their own heart and bring into their practice of actually approaching what they see as a wicked man who has come to them with a nabba. How much more should one be careful if that being is a loving, holy, prayerful soul? Okay? This suddenly says, imagine you have an event or an object. We're going to define it as a Gort, something just generic. And I say, well, when a gort happens, there will be thunder, right? A tight, you know, high, high winds, and there'll be a whole bunch of electrical activity whenever a gort happens, right? And I say, well, we have like thousands of instances, you know, like of gorts where, you know, thunder and lightning, a whole bunch of electro electrical activity happens. And then someone tells you, well, a gort-like day is coming in the future. What are you going to expect? Well, I think it's obvious. You're going to say, well, what I would expect is, is that there would be, well, high winds and there would be lightning and thunder and a whole bunch of electric activity around it. Well, we defined it actually all the way through, and I'm giving you, say, 25 instances of what that means. And I'm saying, okay, well, well, there's another one of these coming. What's it going to look like? Okay. Obviously, it's going to look the same as these ones. You shall see no change in his ways. That's passages repeated in the Quran. Why are we looking for a different event here when they're actually all defined within the Quran as the same thing? I know this is repeating over and over to a certain degree, but it's vital to understand because people are being harmed in ignorance. I look at them, I see them like, as if you will, an inductive study. Okay, I have this naba, this naba. What did they do? What did they say? What did they do? What did they say? How did they reject? How did they get punished? How did they punish people? How did they harm people? I keep setting that all up. And then I hear one's coming. I will sum this up at this point, because I think I've said enough. This is why the common Islamic interpretation of what is coming after the Prophet Muhammad, I cannot at all get on board with. We're going to continue to look at this to show why that is even, for me, a less and less and less and less tenable uh, perspective.
especially on the interpretation of this passage. The Quran seems to explicitly state that Nabaz are coming, and Nabaz can be revelations of God, the day of God, and tales, exclusively tales and stories of prophets. We will look at the two instances after in the next video. So when I see all this, it's over. If you tell me that you have an interpretation of Nabah that is not grounded in these passages, and what we'll look at is to examine and repent, etc. This is what drives me that, yes, this is why he says, Baha'u'llah says to Nasir Din Shah, in the exercise of royal justice, it is not sufficient to give ear to the claimant alone, being the one who's accusing. God saith in the Quran, the unerring balance that distinguishes truth from falsehood. O ye who believe, if a wicked man cometh to you with news, clear it up at once, lest through ignorance you harm others, and afterwards repent for what you have done. The Quran is telling the Islamic community that a revelation is coming, and that they could miss it. That they could miss it. And to be careful. Thank you. Today we're doing our final installment of the Seal of the Prophets. The objection from the Islamic community to the Baha'i community that the Quran states that the Prophet Muhammad is the Seal of the Prophets and therefore there can be no revelation after the Prophet Muhammad and therefore Baha'u'llah cannot be a messenger of God. When we first looked at this, we looked at the concept of seal in the Quran from its Arabic root and saw that seals can in fact actually be removed by God and in some cases by the righteous in the day of God. We also looked at the drumbeat of the Qur'an, how the Qur'an consistently tells stories of how prophets are sent to humankind and then they are rejected by the communities unto which they are sent. This is important, as I pointed out, because all of these stories within the Qur'an end up being irrelevant lessons if we take them to be simply stories about past people and their errors then they are not instructive to the Islamic community of this day. And I propose that this would make massive sections of the Qur'an completely irrelevant to the individual who's reading it. Whereas if we see these stories as warnings to the Islamic community, that they too might follow the path of previous communities, suddenly these sections of the Qur'an become fully relevant. It's important to note how this has been commonly interpreted, and by this I mean the concept of news or tidings, within chapter 49, verse 6. If a wicked man comes to you with news, look into it carefully, lest you harm a people in ignorance and later repent. This concept is currently interpreted as simply information or news, which could be information or news about anything. Another concept I want to put forward, which I have touched on briefly before, is the problem of scales. Today we're going to be looking at a couple instances of the term naba or tidings, within the Quran. There are two of them in particular, and I put these aside because they seem at first glance to not be about prophetic claimants. What I want to bring forward as the problem of scales is that imagine you are reading as a Muslim this quote from the Quran about a wicked man in his tidings, and it is saying that you should examine carefully and lest you harm a people in ignorance and later have to repent. Now, you will think to yourself, well, what does this mean, this tidings? And you think, well, actually, it simply means news. It's not about prophetic claimants. I don't have to investigate individuals who claim to be bringing a message of God, which means you're interpreting this concept of all these stories, including the oceans of ink and pens and the words of God, as being irrelevant data to you particularly. In order to do this, you yourself engage in a study of this term, Naba. You've done exactly what we have done here. And you find throughout your investigation two instances. Two instances, say out of 27, which seem to not fully follow the concept that news in the context of the Quran relates to prophetic claimants. But on the other hand, on your scale, you actually have 25 instances that are telling you that this word is directly related to and about messages from God, messages from the unseen from God, stories of prophets, the Quran itself, which is a Nabah, and the day of God itself, which is a Nabah, a great tiding. 
So you have 25 instances on one side that are telling you, well, this term, when God uses it, as opposed to some individual in your community, when God uses this term, he uses it to talk about messages from himself to his people. And then you take this and you say, well, I'm going to interpret this warning that I might harm a people and later have to repent with these two instances. This would be, I think, unjust. Even if these two instances, which we're going to look about at today, had nothing to do with prophetic claimants, you would still be sitting in front of a data set of, say, 27 instances, and 25 of them tell you that you should take this very seriously, in a very heavy way, pun intended. But you choose to use the two, which are, if you will, exceptions or outliers, to interpret this one instance. This would be unjust. Yet it would be keeping, in some sense, with the way God communicates to humankind. He always gives us an out. You don't have to interpret it this way, but if you're being just when you have 25 instances, and you might, by taking it with the two exceptions, harm a people in ignorance by not investigating and later have to repent, I would suggest this would be a very, very bad idea. One of the things I want to also touch on is the intensity of my emotional content in some of these presentations so far. The reason why is I don't believe this is some academic study into certain terms within the Quran related to religion in general. In the very text itself, it says that you should investigate carefully, lest you harm a people in ignorance. And the reason why I might get emotional surrounding this topic is because people have been harmed. The Babi and Baha'i community throughout history has been persecuted. Individuals tortured, imprisoned, and killed. And some of these people are my friends. This idea that one does not need to investigate when someone comes forward with a claim has actually caused great suffering to communities and to people that I know personally. It's also important to notice that this concept that no messenger is going to come after your chosen messenger is not exclusive to Islam. Christians themselves very often refuse to investigate Islam because they believe that after Jesus Christ came, there would be no messenger from God to humankind until the great day of God, which would be self-evident and everyone could see what was happening, so they have no duty to investigate. The Jewish community themselves believe, for the most part, that they do not need to investigate the claims of either Jesus Christ or the Prophet Muhammad because divine revelation ceased, which is criticized in the Quran, as we saw in the seal video. And this is highlighted by Baha'u'llah in the Book of Certitude. We're going to begin looking now at these two instances. These two, if you will, outliers that on the surface seem at first not to relate to divine revelation. So in this first verse where it says that the hoopoe, a bird, has come from Sheba with tidings true, that tidings true is Naba Yaqeen, very certain tidings. So the hoopoe bird is in Sheba and states that these individuals are worshipping the sun besides God, and that Satan has made their deeds seem pleasing in their eyes. So they think they are doing what is right. They think they are worshipping properly. So what does Solomon do in this case? He hears from his messenger, obviously in this story a miraculous messenger, that the Queen of Sheba is worshipping the sun instead of God. He gets this report this tidings true, stated from the hoopo, and does he take it immediately as true? No, he does not. Soon we shall see whether thou hast told the truth or lied. He is investigating. The hoopo goes to Sheba, comes back and states that these people are idolaters. Solomon himself states that he's not going to take this as, if you will, sorry, gospel, but is going to look into it. And he sends her a letter. And it's interesting here, in verse 29, when it says, the queen says, Ye chiefs, here is delivered to me a letter worthy of respect. It says, Kitab Karim. 
the most noble book, a noble book. And I think it's interesting here because this term is used for the Quran itself. And I'm going to propose something. That what's happening here is the letter being sent from Solomon, who is one of the purported authors of the Old Testament, is sending a letter of his to the Queen of Sheba, a Kitab Karim. And I will propose that outside of some other evidence, this is actually revelation from Solomon. It is a letter, a Kitab Karim, a noble book being given from Solomon to Sheba. Pausing once again, I think it's very important because it says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is the opening of the surahs of the Quran. So this letter being sent to the Queen of Sheba is a noble book, a Kitab Karim, a title used for the Quran itself. And the letter sent to Sheba begins with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, as the surahs of the Quran begin. This can, should not be lost on someone. So when it states this, it says, and come to me, Muslimina, as a Muslim. So, the ambassadors come, Solomon is tested with wealth, he rejects it because what he has is better. He then asks for her throne, the throne upon which she sits, to be brought to him. And it is brought to him. And then it's interesting. Solomon states, transform her throne out of all recognition by her. So take the throne and make it so that she cannot recognize it, change its form, and see whether she is guided to the truth, or if she is incapable of receiving it. So it's very interesting. She comes and there's a test placed in front of her. It is the original throne. The original throne she sat on. Her sovereignty, the sign of her sovereignty. But it's actually changed to look completely differently. But it is, in fact, her throne still. She recognizes it and claims she has been guided to see this. Solomon then diverts her from the worship of false gods. He turns her to the faith of God so that she becomes a Muslim. Solomon in the Quran is given the capacity to speak to the birds. A miraculous ability. He sends the hupo who comes back from Sheba, claiming that there is a person there, he's claiming with sure tidings, that there is a person there, the Queen of Sheba, who worships the sun, does not worship the one true God. He decides to look into this carefully, lest he harm a people. How do we know that? Well, he states he's going to see whether or not the hupo has lied or speaks the truth, and it's important that right after, the Queen of Sheba speaks of how kings will come in and lay waste to countries, causing harm to people. If Solomon had done this initially, he would have done it out of ignorance. But instead, Solomon first looks into the matter himself. And he then presents to her a Kitab Karim, a noble book which, as I noted, begins with the Bismillah. He then asks for her throne to be brought to him, and then it is disguised, as if to see if she can find her true sovereignty even when it looks differently. So she herself has a test that she has to investigate and see what is her own even though it looks differently. So I will state that this story almost on every point, fully accords with the concept of the wicked man as represented in Surah 49, verse 6. There is an individual report, a tiding. Related to what? Related to whether one is accepting the true message of God. There is a claim or a possibility that this is false. Solomon chooses to investigate and look carefully into it so he does not harm a people. When it comes to the throne, I think it's fascinating because this, in a sense, is what one, the Islamic community, asks of the Christian and Jewish community, and the Zoroastrian community, I would add, 
And it is exactly what the Baha'is ask of the Islamic community. How is this so? It's interesting here, and this is a concept that we find over and over and within the Quran, that individuals who were not Islamic in the sense of the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad are deemed to be Muslims, those who submit to God. The Queen of Sheba here becomes a Muslim, and she has asked to become a Muslim. What is this? It's that there is the faith of God, eternal in the past and eternal in the future. The faith of God where out of faith and belief in the divine reality and its communication with humankind, we submit to that. Yet, from a Jewish perspective, when they were looking at, say, for example, looking at Christianity, they would see the throne of their faith, and it's important to note here. If we look back, it says, It kept them from the path of God, that they should not worship God, who brings to light what is hidden in the heavens, in the earth, and knows what ye hide and what ye reveal. God, there is no God but He, Lord of the throne supreme. So it's interesting that this concept of the throne comes up in the case of the throne the Queen of Sheba is sitting on, and then it's stated that the throne of God is actually supreme, and then Solomon has the throne brought from the Queen of Sheba, which she has to see if her true throne can be discerned even though it is altered in appearance. I propose that this is actually what the Jewish people had to do in the case of Christianity. Christianity, although others might see not see this, looks very, very strange to the Jewish eyes. It does not appear to them to be, on the surface, the faith that they originally had. Yet the claim of the Christian community is that it is the very essence of the original faith. The Islamic community, when it actually approaches the Christian community, is saying, well, in the end, Jesus Christ himself was a Muslim. He was a submitter under God. So was Moses. So was Abraham. But it is undeniable that those faiths appear on the surface differently. The throne has been altered in its external appearance, yet it is still that throne. And that is the actual test that any member, say, from an Islamic perspective, that a Christian or Jew or Zoroastrian would actually have to overcome. They would have to be able to see that this, this is their throne. And in fact, it is a symbol of the throne supreme, the throne of God. This is what the Baha'i community is asking of the Islamic community. And in particular, in this series of videos, that this throne might seem different to you on the surface. But you are to be like the Queen of Sheba, who thinks what they're doing is right, right? Their deeds are pleasing to them. But they are to investigate and see if they can see beyond the surface representation to see the throne supreme. So at this point, I think it's undeniable that this is about faith and acceptance of the message of God, of a Kitab Karim. It is, as I said, opening with the Bismillah. It is a story about individuals coming to investigate the possibility of a true revelation from God, from the stance of Sheba. And it's also an investigation from the sacred community of Solomon to ensure they do not harm a people in error for not looking into report and examining. So this next potential exception is just the news of you. Here in chapter 33, the context is actually the besieging of the Islamic community by the Quraysh, the Meccan tribes that are attempting to exterminate the Islamic community. The Confederates are groups that have allied with the Quraysh themselves. And it's stating that if the Confederates, those who allied with the Quraysh, come again, they, these insincere ones, who claim to have faith and claim to be on the side of the Islamic community, but are actually not, will wish they were in the desert with the Bedouins asking about your news. And grammar-wise, this can also mean your news, or news of you. What is the news here? Because obviously that is the context we're looking at. We're trying to understand how is the Quran using this term, and can it be seen in the context of all the other quotes that we have looked at? And I think it fully can. They're asking about his news, your news, the news of the Prophet Muhammad. And it speaks about the Prophet Muhammad himself being a noble pattern, a beautiful pattern that can be followed by the Islamic community. And it says in verse 22, 
This is what God and his apostle has promised us, and he told us what was true. So the believers are saying, well, what we are seeing here is actually what has been told to us by the prophet Muhammad, and it is true. We're seeing that it's coming true. The context is the revelation of God to the apostle. The unbelievers did not believe what God and his apostle told them. The believers did. These are the surahs of the Quran, the revelations about what is to come, the victim of sorry, the victory of the Muslim community in the face of much adversity. They are wishing they'd be out there listening for the news. And what is this news? And it's interesting here in this context, the, it's not Naba singular, it's Anba, which is a plural. Why do we have the plural term Anba? If you look at the Arabic, it doesn't say Naba single. Tiding. It is tidings. Well, what is going on? It's saying that they are out, they will wish they were in the desert asking for your news, your tidings. It's important to notice that at this point in history, the Quran is not fully revealed. A surah would be revealed, time would pass. A surah would be revealed, and time would pass. They're told here in the, in the actual context that they're asking about these anba, these tidings, these news, right, that belong to the Prophet Muhammad. And it is what God and his apostle has told them. The believers are saying this is what God and the apostle have told us, right? And they're saying, well, they're, they're going to wish they're outside listening to what that is, which are the revelations of the Quran themselves, the surahs themselves. Because the Quran is not yet a full book. The anba are they wish they were outside, if you will, getting a pulse on what the, the Prophet Muhammad is saying and what the Islamic community is doing. And I, I believe it's very clear, if we look into the history of Islam and the Quraysh and the Confederates, and even those within the Islamic community who might have been vacillating, this is what they were trying to see. They would be looking and listening to a recently revealed surah to see what it was telling them to do, and what they would need to carry out, and what the future held. Because those who were not firm in their faith, who would not fulfill their vows, were gauging their, if you will, support and adherence to the Islamic community based on what was being said. So can we see this, instead of having these two possible exceptions, and all these other terms being about stories about prophets, revelations from the unseen, communications from God, the Quran being in Daba, right? And the Day of God being in Daba, can we see the Queen of Sheba being in that context? Yes, we fully can. We then have only one instance, which would be this one, but again, when we look at it, I think it's very clear that we can see that they're asking about his revelations. They're asking what the Prophet Muhammad has said, God and his Apostle, right, in this context, has actually proclaimed, which the believers take as revelation, and those who are out with the Bedouins are seeking as information that they can use. So once again, what is it? It's the Quran. It falls fully into the categories that we have previously examined. So I would state, we don't have a single exception in the entire set that cannot be easily seen as part of a set defining Naba or tidings or news as revelations from the unseen, as communication from God and even scripture itself. In chapter 49, verse 6, it states, If a wicked man comes to you with tidings, and I'm going to go right for it here and say, if a wicked man comes to you with stories of the prophets, a pro proposed book of God, a claim about the day of God, or claiming to bring tidings from the unseen court of God himself, because that's how the term is defined, <laughs> then you must look into it carefully. And remember, we looked at Tabayana to investigate, and each of those instances actually related to investigating prophetic claims. So the tidings, if a wicked man comes to you with tidings, and that all had to do, all now can be seen as to doing with revelation and communications from God, look into it carefully, 
which all those contexts actually relate to investigation into prophetic claims, lest you harm a people in ignorance and later have to repent. What about this wicked man? Naturally, if you are supposed to look into such claims from someone you see as wicked, obviously how much more if that individual is deeply pious, has an intense and glorious prayer life, is willing to sacrifice himself, all of his comforts and joys, for the purpose of raising up this claim that God has communicated to mankind. Because this is the prophetic pedigree. So even if it was a wicked man. But there's something else here. We've seen in many of these instances that these people saw the prophets themselves as wicked men. Fomenters of discord. Those who spread corruption in the land. And remember, when we look through the drumbeat of the Quran, the ways that these individuals would begin to justify their persecution and maltreatment of these individuals is they would say things like, well, he's just a man like myself. He's only human. Well, we've known him since he was young. He's one of our people, right? Oh, well, the people that actually follow him are kind of just lowly and they're, they're of no import. But each of these instances, these are claims made against the Baha'i community and against Baha'u'llah himself. And it's important, even if it doesn't mean that Baha'u'llah is a messenger from God, that it's important that the vast majority of rejections and objections posed to it fall into the category of those justifications of prior communities so they did not have to accept a prophetic claim. And here we have the Quran itself and I'll put, I'll put it very frankly, warning the Islamic community that a naba, a tiding is coming, and that when that tiding comes, if they don't look into it carefully, they're going to harm people, and they will later have to repent. But this then gets fed back into the concept of the seal of the prophets itself. You see, from the very beginning of this study, we saw that Baha'u'llah and the Bab never actually debate that the Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the Prophets. That prophecy would be sealed from the Prophet Muhammad's dispensation until the Day of God. But what is that Day of God called? It is called an the Tidings, the Great News. So if there is no naba, no tidings or news, from the Prophet Muhammad unto the Day of God, but at the exact same time, the Quran is stating that if someone comes to you claiming to have a naba, which means, in the context of the Quran, the Quran, revelation, a Day of God, look into it carefully, lest you harm a people in ignorance. What does that inherently tell us? It tells us that we can miss the day of God. It tells us that we can have the day of God come upon us and we can actually reject it. And in our rejecting, see the righteous who have unsealed the choice wine as wicked in themselves and harm them. I think really it's important to look at this and to contemplate this. If he's the seal of the prophets, and the Naba is the day of God, and we have to investigate someone who claims to come with a Naba, revelation, it means we could miss it, because we could harm those people. So how in the end can we look at this concept of the seal of the prophets? I think really, just frankly put, the prophet Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, and today is the day of God. And while the Islamic community can see Baha'u'llah and the Bab as wicked men claiming to have tidings, they best not reject it outright, claiming they are just men. Why doesn't he send down an angel for us? Right? Isn't he just one of us, a man like me? No, they should examine it very carefully. 
because the day of God can be missed. Thank you.